<laughs> Hardest part is how we actually got. Oh my! Get yourself! No, you, you take that fucking thing. You should that off to the camera. We said white boys. We said white would fucking work. Boys and girls, <laughs> I am so right now. Oh my god! <sighs> yes, we got two. Yeah, I mean they need to get a little bit bigger, but that one is a dang good start. <sighs> 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 when it's prom night, I like to. Oh gosh, <laughs> when it's prom night, I like to take fat girls to the dance.
And I promise, guys, I'm shaking because I'm excited, not because I'm relapsing. Let's go. Oh, another one. Another one. Oh. It's prom night, and we're taking all the big girls dancing. You believe? Oh. Do you fish? No. You know, people who don't fish think that fishing is lazy or boring but it is the complete opposite there are a hundred little decisions to be made variables to be considered and you're never quite sure what made the difference did i cast too high too far to the left did i reel it in too slow or, or, or too fast is the lure too shiny or too dull do i stay here or should i go over there and you know it's not luck but you do not know by how much because i am never disappointed out here because i don't expect anything because anything is possible i can be hopeful out here even in failure because i know if i just go out there around that tree it might be different something might be different something i do might make a difference hell yeah angler's choice baby john morris Y river ranger train Nitro, let's go, baby! Woo! What the hell is even that? You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, ah. Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle. Located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know. Don't know what happened there, guys. Sorry about that. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live. This is the last Monday Night Live of March. Um, this is a couple weeks late. I, I really wanted to do a Aquaquan Reservoir episode after I had the chance to like fish them. And I was like, I'm going to be able to make the last one in March. I really thought so. Then I realized I also had a confrontation with plans I made with my wife that I forgot about until the last minute, so that's on me. So I decided to do it now, um, I guess, after the last one of March. So if I'm not mistaken, there's two a month basically all the way through until the classic that'll be held in the fall. So we have we are two down already. Uh, for the very first one, and if I was a, a really good host of a show, I would have actually done some prep work and not have made an intro uh, to the weights from the previous one, but the very first one of the year, we had Jackson and all Aldermerman, Aldermerman. This is why for the guests, I make sure I, I know how to pronounce names for, but Aldermerman 35.6 ounces. That's what won 35 pounds, six ounces won the first Aquaquan Reservoir tournament. And then I know it took over 30 to win this second one. And so we're going to have a couple of guests in here, probably circling out through the night, just to really talk about this reservoir. Cause you hear about places. And a friend will tell you, like, oh, this place is really good. This is interesting. And, you know, I'm blessed with the platform that I have is I get a few people that say, like, we should try this place out. Ever since I started this show, everyone's talked about Aquan is so good, Aquan is so good. But it's like, I don't have a boat. It's a big lake, relatively big for electric motor only or a 9.9 .9 size motor. And I have a Ranger. Oh, and I really want a trolling motor around the place. Lake Frederick and Winchester feels kind of big for my boat when I'm trying to get around. It's like, I don't really want to do it. And, Finally, my friends convinced me I did it. My God, that place, it's really good. I, I, I don't know how to say it, but it's a really, it, it can humble you, but you can truly have some of the best days of your life on the water. And this first person I'm going to have on here, uh, he, I met him actually uh, the, the first the first tournament of the year a couple weeks ago. Really, really cool dude. Uh, Steven uh, Nisumai. Steven Nisamai, I really hope I pronounced that right. I am 0 for 6 right now. Steven, how are you doing today, sir? Good. How's it going? It's actually Stefan, but it's, it's all good. That was close enough. <laughs> Damn it. I am 0 for 6. Chat, you are already killing me. I love it. Um, hey, it's all good. Dude, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. It's it's an honor. Actually, when I discovered your channel you know, a while back, I've, I've been following you since. Um, and I've been seeing familiar faces. You got you interview here on on your channel, and it's nice to like see those familiar faces and you know get share knowledge and get that wealth of knowledge from others. So it's it's been really nice following your channel. So when you when you messaged me saying, "Hey, you want to come on?" I was like, "Of course." You know, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna deny that. I might not have the wealth of information that others, um, but you know, I always like to network with people and and share. You know, so I think what's interesting about 
Aquaquan Reservoir. I was listening to a couple of Joe Rogan episodes this past uh, weekend, and it's the fact they talk about like how you get these comedy clubs, and it's so funny, like how you get all this talent at this little small place that you wouldn't know about. In a couple of years, you're like, oh crap, these are like Chappelle, Louis C.K. It's crazy. Aquaquan <laughs> Reservoir is kind of like that for the fishing community. There are so many hammers that yep. fish the tournaments there, and unless you go, they'd be like, holy shit, you're here, you're here, you're here. It's nuts. Yeah, yeah, like. I mean, for years, I've been following social media with a lot of those guys. And, you know, I've been meeting them in person also throughout the years, fishing the reservoir. And, you know, I'll see and also talking to them, but I'll see also when they post those bags. And I've been to some of the weigh-ins, but when they when they post those bags and I I mean, it's been like that even before LiveScope got, you know, really popular in like 2019 with everybody. Um, even before then, they were bringing back like close to 30 pound bags and over 30 pound bags. So I've always looked up to those guys and I'm always, I was always like, how do they just go out there almost like every Sunday they have a tournament and it's like guaranteed they're going to bring back these heavy fish, you know, and I'm, it's like, I'm always trying to figure out how can I do that as well. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. It's, it's the Aquaquan Reservoir is definitely a place like that. It's like, kind of like you got that small niche community of fishermen who just, they've been fishing it for a while and they, they know how to fish it. So, um, and I'm, I'm trying to get there. I'm, I'm I feel like I'm on that path getting to that point. Um, so but that's i definitely look up to those guys those are definitely people i i look up to over the years and um like thomas alderman for sure like he just won the club record like you just mentioned earlier um with over 35 pounds and i know it's of six fish but it doesn't matter right like those each if you if you do the average of each of those fish it's it's, it's over stupid. five so i mean it's it's insane yeah. um so yeah I, I i i definitely look up to those guys um for sure and it it's and since we don't have uh, any of the other guests here yet, I'm going to share the screen, guys, just so you can kind of get an idea for this weight. I, th I think it's just better to do it this way, and that way everyone can have it. You can screenshot it if you're if you're watching and you want to do that as well. Let's pull this up here. So, you know, example Alderman Jackson. They had I'll probably make the screen a little bit bigger here for you guys, uh, but they had an absolutely redonkulous amount of weight. Oh, what happened there? There we go. All right, so. 35 pounds, six ounces or, or 60 ounces, follow that up with a 22. And this is what I talked about. And we're going to get into this too today, but then, then you have, uh, I have no idea how to do that last name without Roop and Roop, I guess, brothers, 20 yeah, pounds. Yep. I did it. Yeah. I got one, right. Uh, 20, 20 pounds first turning, but then you back it up with 35. Um, Mick Jesus, Mick Jesus and Titus, uh, they had 21. Then they, you know, followed up with a disappointing second place with 33. So it's interesting, like this place, it's almost like humbling you is like 15 to 20 pounds, but anywhere yeah. else in the world, that's like really good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It could even put you in the top of anywhere else. Um, but yeah, good, good point. Good point. You know, um, even like was yesterday when I was fishing it, I, I didn't have hardly any bites, you know, just until the end, I finally started getting on them and I got that one good one. But I mean, on the other days, you know, of course, when I'm fishing, I'd, I'd be catching them. But like I said, yeah, it can be definitely be humbling for sure for even for those guys who the top dogs who were making the standings, you know, so um, it can be really tough. But on those good days, like you said, like even when I met you, it can be magical. It's just it can be an amazing place. How did you get involved with Fountainhead? I mean, are you from this area originally? Yeah, so I grew up actually on Lake Barton in Burke. Uh, so Burke is in here in Fairfax County, which is actually just maybe 15 minutes from the reservoir from Fountainhead. Um, so I, I grew up on a small neighborhood lake just down the street from the from the reservoir. And I mean, ever since I was a little kid, I loved fishing, just just being on the lake. That was kind of like it just came uh, kind of part of my lifestyle. Um, so, you know, I just I'd be catfishing, fishing for panfish. But, um, you know, I, I won't give my whole life story or anything. I won't bore anybody with that. But and I promise this will lead to the reservoir. But uh, there was one day when um, I was in my early 20s and this young kid, I was out fishing and I was just, I saw this one young kid, he caught like a three and a half pound bass. And that was bigger than any bass I ever caught out there at that lake. And so then I really became obsessed. I was like, my goal was to be, always catch like that biggest bass in the lake um, and in any lake that I fished. So I had like kind of like that trophy chaser mindset. And then uh, before I even moved off that lake, they ended up dredging that lake, which is for people who don't know, like neighborhood lakes, they have to basically like dig it out and to keep it deep um, so that it doesn't shallow over. 
Uh, so that just like ruined the fishing back then. Mm. Um, and so I would go and hop around other neighborhood lakes, like Lake Braddock is really well known. Um, people have caught like double digits back in the day in there. Wow. And uh, Lake Royal, which was really great fishing when I started fishing there. Um, so I ended up meeting a really great friend of mine now. His name is James Higgins. He's really popular here in Nova and in the fishing community here in general. Uh, he also used to run the Dreadneck uh, YouTube fishing channel. Uh, so I met him at Lake Royal and it was kind of one of those things where like, you know, and like sometimes you meet somebody and you're like, you don't get along at, at first and you're kind of like, ah, I don't know. Well, we ended up becoming like best friends. Right. So it's kind of like one of those cases. And he ended up uh, him and his his girl ended up moving to the reservoir um, and he'd be messaging me like, hey, man, like I'm having a hard time fishing here. Like, you know, I'll say, so I said, hey, let's let's fish it together. Um, so we would just go on the banks and fish it. And I'm saying, hey, this is not working we need a boat. Uh, so then I ended up getting a 14 foot John boat, like an older mm -hmm. one. I just, cause I didn't have that much money at the time. Um, and so just saved up for like a small John boat to get out on the water. It was a 1436. So, um, so people who don't know that's like 14 foot long and 36 inches wide. So it was wobbly. It's really narrow 36 inches. Well, that's like three feet. Um, but we made it work for two years and it leaked, <laughs> but James and I, and some other friends that I brought out on it, um, we made it work with just the trolling motor and we ended up getting on some good fish. Uh, James, I think even caught his PB on my boat of like almost seven pounds or a little over seven pounds there, wow. um, which he's really happy about. Uh, but you know, even just over those couple of years, we realized this, this is still not going to work. I mean, we need something better, um, for which then I ended up uh you know getting rid of that boat and saving a little more money for which i got that 2001 bass tracker which i've been fixing up um and finally got it all really nice that's the boat you saw me in um last week during the tournament uh so you know i've just been fixing that up i got like new carpet new trolling motor new electronics on it you know with live scope new seats new wiring and um so i've just been i've been using that uh but the one thing i've, I've realized is that was another mistake was because you know it has a 50 horsepower on the back and so i so for a while i was still st stuck with a trolling motor so if i no matter where i launch whether it be fountainhead whether it be like who's run or anywhere on the reservoir you know because it's a 99 restricted lake um i couldn't go far and i'd always be worried oh well, am i going to make it back to the launch if i even did go far right um so that's why i decided to finally this winter get a kicker motor um for which i now put on the tracker so now i can fish the reservoir the right way which i should have done years ago but uh everything has its time right um, out of curiosity why did you keep the 50 versus like trading the 50 in for a nine you know i i love the river i used to fish the river a lot um and i just didn't want to take the speed gotcha. away from the river you know, but it, it's funny now and in, in really in hindsight, thinking about it and really talking to friends and also realizing I'm probably the slowest <laughs> at launching it out of these tournaments. And now that I've realized I've, I'm probably thinking about I'm going to go ahead and take the 50 off and move the 25 over to the middle or maybe just save up for a John boat and have a good uh, John boat rig and just move the 25 onto that John boat. Because um, I I know that that having that 50 now and, and competing at the Fountainhead Bass Club having that 50 on with all that weight and, and trying to move, yeah. I'm, I'm going like seven and a half miles an hour. So it's a handicap. I don't think that's what's the biggest handicap. Um, but it's definitely handicapping me to a certain extent. Everybody's moving and beating us to being me, beating me and my partner to the points and stuff. So, um, but I've done, I've definitely have to do something about that kind of soon. Um, so I'll have to make a decision what to do with that 50 horsepower. It's hard because you almost do again, guys, like, you know, don't tell your wives this, but you need two boats. You do need a, uh, a res boat specifically and then something because it is a tale of two crazy things where you have like aquaquan reservoir then you have the tidal potomac which is an ocean like it's yep. two extremes yep yep and I, I realized also when i got that tracker i was like stuck in the middle like especially when when you know i'm a trophy chaser but now I, in the recent years i was trying to become more of a competitor mindset and type of fisherman and and i realized even that was another mistake was you know 50 horsepower that's fast but it's still not it's it's not good enough for the big tournaments on the river, right? With those guys with the two fifties, but it's also too big for now the fountainhead bass club tournaments out on the reservoir. So I was like kind of stuck in between is like too yeah. big for these too small for that. So I was like, you know what, let me just get um, a nine, nine, put it on the side and call it a day for now for which I mean, yeah, it's definitely getting me around and I can fish the reservoir the right way, but I need more speed and I have the need for speed. <laughs> so what are I'm the Burke lakes like? 
Say like again. the other the other lakes in Northern Virginia that you mentioned earlier. I mean, I, I remember w when my aunt used to live in Reston, we would go fish oh. some of those lakes. Are, are they still have fishing opportunities there, like you said, or is that like w did when you spoke of them earlier? Was that more of like in the past? Yeah, no, uh, definitely. Even I know friends who still fish them now. Um, they they'll hop on the boat with me, but sometimes we'll go fish the bank, and I'll they'll text me saying, "Hey, I'm at Lake Braddock, or I'm here at Lake Audubon in in Reston." And, you know, I just caught a Mondo. So, I mean, there's, there, there's still good fish in there. There's still good fishing. And I, and I, now that you brought up those Reston lakes, I, I love them. Um, Lake Audubon sp specifically, I caught my second trophy out of there. Really? Um, wow. So, I, yeah, I have a special place there. I, I like Audubon and all four of the lakes in Reston are really good. Um, Do you, you have to have like a figure it permit? Out time. Do you have yeah. to have a permit or something? Like, say, if you're a kid that's listening to this thing now, is that like a lake that you have to get special permission to fish any of those or? Or can you go fishing? Yeah, if you're on a if you're on a boat, you you you're supposed to either be with somebody or you're supposed to have they're supposed to have like a pass, like a neighborhood pass on the boat. Um, but fishing the bank is is totally fine. You can just go fish the bank. There we got a, okay. we got so many questions here. I'm gonna make sure we get them all get to them all right now, guys. Um we got uh, and degenerate fisherman kind of asked this already or answered this already, but I'll I'll put it up here. Shane Flynn Outdoor says, How long does it take to run the length of the res with a nine point nine? Uh not long at all. Uh, I mean, if, like a true nine nine, and on, and on a on a John boat, like a fourteen foot John boat, uh, less than an hour, you can make it probably from one end to another. Wow, that's really awesome. And then yeah. let's see it's here, it's like a little over two two thousand acres, if I remember, it's like twenty one hundred acres. It, it winds in and out. The only thing is, if you're trying to make it from one end to the other something there's going to be a lot of obstacles and what those obstacles are there's gonna be those crew members there's a lot of high school and college crew teams out there and sometimes you're just gonna to have to like slow down to either not wake them or you're gonna to have to kind of like wind back and forth like so that you don't go too close to them so that's probably going to slow you down from going from one end to another but straight shot probably less than an hour it is the most weird dynamic where that lake is used as a glorified swimming pool for a sport i don't think anyone gives a shit about um just oh, putting man. it out there don't know any yeah. kids that i grew up with that that was their college scholarship was through rowing but you know it is what it is i'll tell you thomas i it's crazy i so i know mike fisher who runs the fountainhead bass club tournaments i i just heard recently that um or i learned recently that he tries to make the tournaments on the off days like on days that they don't run those like i guess they're called regattas um like those tournaments that or races that they have with those crew members but i mean really any other day that i i fish out there which is pretty much every day <laughs> um i they're out there and they're and they're loud they're not just in the way but you know if you want some peace and quiet you're probably not going to get much of it there unless you're at one end or the other so like if you're at who's run like that end of the lake the crew members their their lanes end there by the dam so like pretty much from the dam on to through who's run and all the way to the, that end you'll you'll have some like peace and quiet um and also like the bull run end so like up lake at the opposite end of the reservoir like if you launch out of the marina and go right, you'll you'll stay you'll stay away from the crew members as well. And there's there's miles of fishing up there. I have a lot of history up there too. I used to hike there up after high school, like all the time, just fishing from the bank. There's small mouth up there too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. And then yeah, one first, question. I was gonna before. say the first tournament, the first tournament I ever did. Um, you know, because this isn't the first time I I ran with the guys in the Fountainhead Bass Club. This is the first time I'm actually just committing to a full season. But I've done the tournaments before, and I remember the first tournament I ever I ever um, ran with the guys. I brought a smallmouth back, smallmouth back to the weigh-in, and everyone's like, "Whoa, whoa!" But I heard it's actually kind of a, a usual. Usually, there's like a couple that bring back to the weigh-in at the Fountainhead Bass Club. Smallmouth. And, and one question I know that we're going to be getting in the comment section at some point or on the re-upload is about like the nine point nine restriction, all that. I'm going to get somebody on from the DWR or or the road team or something because I just. I am confused about that too. Why one lake could be a thousand acres and you can use an outboard and another lake is like a 9.9. .9, then another lake is electric. Like it's all confusing as hell to me. So I'm going to try to get somebody on from the state to explain like, how do you make these decisions? Cause that's all I want to know is like, is there a decision that's put through that we can use for each lake? Or is it literally they close their eyes and throw a dart at the board and say like, this one's going to be nine, nine restricted. Because Seems the like Baltimore it, lakes, but, yeah. I mean, I, I've been thinking is like with the like like again, not to bring it back to the crew members, but yeah, I think it really is because of them. There's it's just like residential, and you have so many like high school teams. Like every high school in Nova crew team practices and yeah. has their races. I think out there on the reservoir. So 
they don't want people speeding because you know it's it's really windy i mean it's just it's it, if you look at the reservoir from the map it's a very it just s's the whole time so i don't think they want people speeding past the corners and then oh all of a sudden there's a crew member and it's just unsafe for people i mean that's what i'm assuming but i i would like to know too thomas you know it, it's frustrating because it is it's just they and oh here it is oh shane's hit my go button drinking water reservoirs don't allow gas motors you're right except astronauts piss in their suits and that works too uh, I think I think the drinking I think the say for drinking water is the biggest excuse that for your health you don't allow something you can 100 like Smith Mountain Lake is used for water Claytor Lake is used for water these are yeah. massive reservoirs that you have engines in and you can still run the outboard I do yeah. not believe it it's just that it's something else there's so many lakes that are big enough that you can filter out I I yeah. truly think there's something else there just yeah. my thoughts though uh yeah, like i was even wondering like why hunting run reservoir why is that electric only or, or mooney they're, they're pretty big you can have a 99 on there but i don't know it might be residential especially mooney i think mooney is like especially if you guys have been to mooney it's very open at the base where the where the um the boat ramp is so it's not even like you could make an argument that you need a 99 restriction at the res because it's so snaky you don't want a collision that's a better argument than just the drinking water. Mooney is very open. Like it would be harder to turn a corner at Mooney and then hit somebody coming around the other way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That, that's just, just my opinion. Uh, degenerate yeah. angler, uh, Aquan reservoir is used for drinking water and allows gas. And I, I know, I know that that's awesome. Again, that's what my, that's my whole point about this. And this is what I'll find out. This is my big thing for this year is to figure that out. Cause like, I just want some clarity on like how all these rules are figured out. John says, Hey Mike, you need to get out there. Swim bait guys, wreck G shop. I think I said that message, right? We will be having a swim bait guy on eventually. I think he's mowing his grass right now. I kid you not. Um, we're going to be figuring that out as well. Let's see now. Yeah. Yeah. Phil said he's coming. He's got two more passes on the lawnmower and he wants to give, he wants to give his man some time in the spotlight. Uh, I'm reading the message for Bayon right now. Ride. Yeah. So, you know, with that said, I, I didn't meet you out on the lake. You're there a bunch, like explain to people that have never been to the reservoir, a cliff note of the lake. Is it kind of like no structure, no docks, rocky and clear? Is it dirty with timber? Like, what is it? You know, really what I love about it is it's a mix of almost everything. So, you know, you'll have flats, you'll have you'll have grass ledges and, and like grass on, on the side of the banks. And then you'll have those deep rock bluffs where those grass edges can meet as well. Um, those are really good areas. And then you'll have like those those creeks and coves and like the mouths of those creeks where like fallen timber has, you know, fallen around those mouths of those creeks, which are really good. Um, and especially when they're around those like secondary points and main points as well um i mean it's really it's like a mix of everything and then you know you so like the up lake you got bull run side it's it's really it gets really shallow so you have like the main creek that goes through it and on both sides of the or should, i shouldn't say creek it's a channel the channel and on both sides of the channel you have like huge flats which is actually a really good time this year um during pre-spawn and spawn um but yeah, and then you go opposite if you go down lake towards like fountainhead and past fountainhead like lake ridge marina and then towards the dam i mean we're talking almost 70 feet i've, I've marked i think 69 feet near the dam uh is the deepest so i mean you're it's so versatile and then even near the dam you have like up even near the dam in that whole like who's run area and lake ridge area you'll have like shallows and ledge, ledges that come up to like shallow flats that you can fish and some of them will have grass and then some won't some will have like just fallen timber just in a great structure where the fish love so in the tournament like yesterday for example like i was just running a spinner bait through through some of that and you'll just see big ones like follow on the scope um which i ended up landing that that nice one on a extra large spinner bait um uh from juan duran actually he was he's a big guy on the reservoir um but yeah it's re it's real it's real versatile and that's it's not really like, oh, mostly rocks or mostly flats or anything. It's, it's, it's almost like you can get a mix of everything. So if like you decide, Hey, you know what, I'm, I'm trying to fish some grass today. And I, I really think the bat, the bass are going to be up in the grass or more of the shallows. Like you can like focus on that and, and plan out your area. Like, okay, this is, this has more of the grass. I'm going to kind of fish this area. Um, but yeah, I hope that answers that. It, it did. And uh, it is a beautiful lake. And the only thing it really lacks, like as it's been stated, is like it doesn't have a dock pattern like a Lake Anna or a Normandy or something like that. But it, it is. It's a beautiful lake. And there's a there's a ton of bait. Like, I don't think unless you've been out there a lot, 
and scoped it or just saw it with your eyes. I'm blessed. I do have scope and you just scan real quick and you're like, good Lord. There's so yep. much bait in this lake. Million, literally millions, like whether on side scan, down scan, the scope. And I, what I've noticed is in those areas that have like just tons of bait and it's just constant when, when you're side scanning or you're scoping around and you just see, it's just like a, just a whole like line of bait basically on the, on the uh, thermocline or wherever they're, they're deciding to be. I've noticed that actually those type of areas I, I try to stay away from, like, I'll still fish them a little bit. I might, I may catch some, but I feel like that sometimes will, uh, you know, handicap you if you, if you are fishing around too much bait, but yeah, you're right. The res is just filled with bait, which can be like a good thing, but then it can also be, I feel like a, like a bad thing. Like my style of fishing is I like to fish more of like around where it's not like millions of bait and main lake and coming into like the, the, the coves. So I, I try to, fish a little bit away from that, um, where bait is a little bit more limited. So I, I don't know what the bass think, but I would assume that they are going to bite more where bait is less. Um, but yeah, I, I think that is an interesting thing. Cause I know so many professional anglers have different viewpoints on that, but I, I think generically speaking, their view is if it is clouds of bait, you got to get out of there because it's just yeah. too much. And, and that's what and I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and you really do see that at certain points of the lake. It's just absolutely insane. This comment here has me baffled, so I'm going to share it. Maybe someone else knows. H O two H O two October twenty second twenty five nineteen eighty seven. Following the annual meeting of the Clay Mineral Society, and if does anyone understand what that means, please let me know, boss. If you want to like add more to that, that's code that I have no idea what you're talking about. There, <laughs> I, I apologize. So before yeah, was, we bring in Boyd Duckett, in so I don't know. <laughs> before we bring in Boyd Duckett Jr., it looks like he's off his motor. motor and uh, and Russ Hamilton, I you know, bring this up here. Russ says uh, Phil's probably Phil shouldn't drink and mow at the same time. You know, he's he's able to do multiple things. What were some of the baits that you used that really got you got it done for you the first tournament and the second tournament? Uh, well, so this season actually, so far the first tournament nothing i didn't we, me and my partner i didn't get much uh my partner he got four and he ended up getting them on spinner bait uh the um uh some top water like right here buzz bait he got it on a single one but i use double i like using double why um and we were throwing glides but nothing but i know that a lot of guys in the fountainhead club uh the first tournament and the second tournament they got some really good ones on the glides um we were throwing them but tourney days i didn't get any but of course on the off tourney days i got them on the glides as well <laughs> but uh so yesterday yesterday um i got a nice one so I, I got some really nice follows on the spinner bait on, a, on this really large size 15 holy lord yeah, man i think it's like the biggest blade that they make i, I, I can't find a that looks like a flutter spoon. I, I Let's see. There you go. Yeah. So I got that off Juan Duran. That's a jackal megalodon or megalo. Uh, that makes sense bait. if it's megalodon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me megalo spinner bait. Um, but basically, I mean, I just like throwing spinner baits in general during this time of year and in fall. Um, I, just, I just love the way they look. I feel like they just really trigger those fish to follow. I mean, pr the scope proved it. Um, the graphing is proving it. And then I caught that nice, like, four and a half pounder, which. You know, really made my day because we were having a tough time yesterday. My partner didn't get any bites, and I wasn't getting any bites either. And just until the very end, and then got some follows, and landed that that nice one on this huge spinner bait. The camera really doesn't even do this justice. I mean, this is like bigger than my hand. Dude, than my hand. the amount of people that are now this is what they want. All right, so we got like two or three people. We got Chris. Uh, what spinner bait are you throwing? And then Shane says, "I need one of these now." Uh, yep, yeah, that's I need the one jackal. of those. That's a Jackal Megalo spinner bait. It's you, you should, it's probably the best to get them off like JDM, like, you know, Japanese tackle, uh, specific websites. Um, if anybody's interested, you can just message me and I'll, I'll send you a link or something. But I actually ended up getting that off Juan Duran, which is, he's really good at the fisherman. I, I look, he's one of the guys that I look up to on the res. Um, he was with actually Matt McCluskey, I, I believe when, uh, McCluskey caught the potential crappie a state record crappie out of the reservoir as well um but yeah i got that off i got that off Juan, and when i caught that nice one at the tournament which i know didn't not much it doesn't 
it's nothing compared to the other guys, but I was proud of it. And then I had to message one. I was like, Hey man, I got, <laughs> I got a nice one off, of, off your spinner bait. So that, that was really awesome. But, uh, you know, also what I like to throw and I haven't, again, you know, on the off, off days, I'll catch them on glides, but of course on tourney day yesterday, I didn't catch any, but I love to throw these big glides. So this is, uh, by fish everything. So Victor Depp, he has the fish everything brand. I know this has been, this is kind of like beating a dead horse on your channel, but this Let's beat it again. I have yeah. <laughs> speaking of the dead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. With Phil. Yep. Uh, from fish, everything. And so this, this one is great. I also throw, um, so I really like the bull shad trick shad as well. So they're, they're shorter. This is seven and a half inch, but, um, the fish, you're going to get some hate mail for, for that one. Say again, you might get some hate mail from that one, but it's okay. Uh -oh. uh, I'll back up <laughs> on that. Uh, I mean, oh. Hey, it, it kills here, by the way, everyone. It, yeah. Say again. Bill, every word, every other word is going in and out, boss. Yeah, no good service. <laughs> so yeah, but um, <laughs> Phil, you don't have good service, I think. But I'm people who know me, they they know that I'm really big into swim baits. Like my favorite type of fishing for bass is using big swim baits, and I'm talking like seven inch plus. Um, so, but you know, the backstory also on this, on, um, this is a taxi shad 10, which I think now the mold has Victor Depp's mold has shrunk. So he told me it's more of like a nine inch now. Um, but this there's the backstory on this. I love this. I don't know if they've even talked about this on your channel yet, Thomas, but you know, a year, maybe about a year ago or a little over Matt Streichel from SB fishing, the um, YouTube channel, which guys, if you don't know that definitely subscribe to SB fishing. He's like the epitome of fishing YouTube channels. Um, but, uh, Matt Streichel was out, I think with his brother ACE and they ended up catching the reservoir record. It was like nine and a half pounds or so, um, on like a chatterbait or something. And it was during a tournament and they brought it back to the fountainhead, uh, ramp to weigh in, released it there. That's what we all do. We just released the fish there at the ramp and, not but too much later Stry matt strikel ended up catching that same fish in the same spot as well so he compared the pictures he was like that's this by golly that's the same fish mm -hmm. uh and i've always loved that story like that's always stuck in my head like you know fish instinct is just incredible like just miles away they can just go back to the same spot and just know where to go it just blows my mind but the that so the backstory though on this bait is um just real quick is just not long ago, maybe a few weeks ago, Victor Depp, the maker of this bait, was out there with his friend, and they caught that same lake record, and it was their first time being on the Occoquan Reservoir. Uh, so I just love that story, um, and it was on it was on this bait, um, the Taxi Shad. That poor it's fish has been caught head. so many times. It's <laughs> just <laughs> three that we know of. I guess At three least. that we know of so far. So, all right, joining us live from the back of a cop car, Phil. How you doing? <laughs> Bad. Russ was right. It for some reason, I think I used a bunch of my data today when I was sitting in those classes because I just could not get reception in my shop. So we're gonna rock with this. Um, I hear you better now. Yeah, you, you sound really good. You have so many questions though. First one, Phil, is uh oh shit, is that a PDJR? And then Phil is sponsored it, by Coors Light, right? Uh I I've you know, there's nothing in, on paper, but in my heart, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> he needs to be riding a lawnmower, drinking at the same time for eight hours. That's the best sponsor now, you can get. Who started that rumor? Because I was not drinking on the lawnmower, although I, I just made it up. I just made it up. I don't know. <laughs> and, you know, it is fun. It is real fun when you got to mow for eight hours that I passed my test. I did. I did pass my test. It wasn't a test. It was just watching mind numbing safety videos about, you know, team lifting and lockout tag out. So oh, wow. does, does that mean the ankle bracelet finally comes off? Uh, two weeks, two weeks. There we go. Just in time for our next tournament. Let's go. Yep. You can still throw glide blade glide baits with an ankle. But how's that not a shirt? <laughs> Right. Um, oh my gosh. Um, you, as you guys, you guys are going to be at the next one. Yeah. I'm yeah. Awesome. 
I, I'm going. Uh, I, there's, I couldn't make all of them just with scheduling. I think there's like 15. There's a lot. The guys, if you don't know, if you're listening to this, there, there's a few tournaments. I think it's like two a month until what, September, right? Yeah. 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 I so, think so. 30 of them to make the classic. You have to fish 30 of them? And you have yeah, to do well enough. So that that's basically yeah that's what they that's what they say and that's kind of like the the rule but I, I've I've come to learn that like there, there's so many people that just drop out that you can make the classic just fishing like a few tourneys sometimes like it's like my partner was just explaining that to me the other day how there was this there was this one season he he didn't fish that many tournaments they didn't have that much weight they still made the classic so I mean what so like the first tournament there was a 23 boat show out and then there's already dropped down to 16 the second one yeah so yeah i was trying to be there but it just thomas had anniversary I, stuff yeah i I'll can't for you guys i'm not so, i'm um, not famous enough yet that i can actually get out of, of wife stuff sorry guys um <laughs> we got to get, get you famous enough then <laughs> <laughs> um uh. what was my thought Shit, i had a thought oh we were talking about glide baits and i thought that was a really good segue to go from one individual to the guy who uh i mean i think you have close to fifty thousand views on my instagram at least from that insane catch i put it in the intro to this one phil you had one on this bait just nuke it at the boat like that was a special Wait, day wasn't it that, i leave it in the, is that the one that you bought or did i leave that yes bait in your i boat? bought it you're <laughs> okay it. i didn't no, i didn't see the eye i heard when you uh. brought it by Look like the one that I was fishing that doesn't have the eyes on it. Uh, <laughs> I just realized I left those baits in my other vehicle, but what a day. Yeah. You want to talk like about that? it? All 10 pixels of it. Use all 10 pixels of your audio right now to uh, talk about that day. Cause it, was that one of the best swim bait tournament days you've had? Oh, yeah, the best one for sure. Tournament? Oh, not even close. I mean, if you can get four, five bites like that in a day fishing the big stuff like here and first time on the body of water, stuck to the trolling motor, no practice, and... You know, just going out and fishing, I mean, just fishing instinct and based on what you and I knew the fish should be doing this time of year, like that's for Virginia, that's really good. Yeah. I would say that is a handicap we should add to that is Phil and I rolled, I woke up, I went to bed at new, midnight and I got up at four, rolled out of bed, never fished this place before. Phil shows up. He's never fished this place before. We have a boat and a trolling motor and we like just a trolling motor and we just, and we were late, I think to launch our boat too. Cause I had to go take a really? dump. Yeah. So well, it was I, I there five. Like I was way, I was watching people roll in. I was like, oh, Thomas will get here. <laughs> I did. Um, but yeah, for us to roll in there and do that, that was pretty incredible. And honestly, to watch you work that bait, it does remind me again, and, I, and I've said this before, and I think this confirms it, it reminds me of the old school jig bites. And when I was fishing high school, I had that one old guy in the club that smoked a lot. And he was like, Tom, all you gotta do is lock a jig in your hand. Cause if you get five, you're going to be cashing a check. And nope. it, it's basically that watching you that thing, you got five bites and we were so close to cashing a check. I was so impressed cool. when I pulled up, when I pulled up next to you guys and you were like, how'd you do? And I said, nada. And you guys, well, we got a five bag. I was like, nice. <laughs> I mean, we got four, we had four fish, but I think we we made nineteenth place. Um, but you guys did great. I was I was proud of you. You know, I mean, I'm that's my home lake, and you you guys came for your first time and 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 really did well. Impressed me. So I'm that was, that was good for you guys, man. Phil, yeah, the stars kind of really aligned. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, it's not just that. Coming, uh, no, go, ahead. no go, go go ahead go ahead i was gonna say now now one of us need to make top three one day oh, god that's no cool. that's not gonna happen oh it will hey hey you gotta put it out there in the universe it's gonna happen it, if we happen. can if we can hit a couple more before post spawn maybe even we could do it post spawn too 
I mean, it could definitely happen. I, I feel pretty Summer good when the bike gets tough. I think I feel it's so funny because like I we talked about this on the boat, Phil. Like I am very much like I have no problem feeling like I can fill out a limit every day. It's gonna be probably ten pounds, but I'll catch six. Mm. You're my big home run hitter where you feel like if you don't catch a ten pounder, it was a bad day on the water. <laughs> go big or go home, yeah, type deal. Yeah. Well, it's I even before I fished swim baits, I was always that guy when I was fishing with my buddy Cam. Every single time he would be the one to catch 10 and I would catch two or three, but they were bigger than 90, 95, hundred percent of his fish. Like it's just how it worked every time I've always been like that. And so that's been kind of like my deal with tournaments is like, I've been getting back into the conventional a lot more, um, trying to apply things i've learned throwing the big baits and stuff and things i've seen um and and get better at filling out that bag and and getting those bites but i didn't have to the other day because thomas had me he uh he got a bunch of fish in the boat real quick on the swim jig and yeah. i was able to just lock that thing in my hand and go to work and not even think about it so that was super nice and, and awesome. what was interesting is there was two that really worked for me. The one is in the boat still, so I didn't have that, which is the California No Jack Dirty Jig Swim Jig. And I put a 5.5 Kytec white on it. It was a white uh, white trailer with a – I think it's the crappie or the shad color. It's the white and, like, with the specs. Um, that's the one I threw. And then I also paired it up with the Bastrix one. This is a Bastrix hollow belly with a 5.16th ounce bluegill colored one. Um I just feel way more confident throwing this in a spinnerbait or a chatterbait behind people. And going into this tournament, everyone and their brother said a spinnerbait works. And I get very, I don't know, like on the spectrum that if everyone's doing one thing, I want to do the opposite. And yeah. I just had more confidence. I could fish behind people and have success. The one thing that was interesting is we got to live stream that day on the water. And it was funny going back and watching it and seeing the comments that would pop up. There were people that were like, oh, never fish this bank here because it's going to suck. Only high percentage areas. And so we went to this back of the pocket. It's straight across from the boat ramp. Everyone knows what we're talking about. You had all the nice stuff on the left, and then you had this boring bank on the right. And so I hit purposely the boring bank first, and we smoked two right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And it just is interesting when you only have a trolling motor – you're going to end up fishing everything. And it, I think that helped Phil and I out a little bit that because we fished the moment so much, we were able to kind of dial in where those fish were. And, and, and Phil, you can talk to this too. The swim bait bite actually evolved over the day, didn't it? Oh yeah. hundred percent. I mean, you had, we saw a complete 180 in conditions from the first half of the day to the second. Like it was like, clockwork like it was like 12 o'clock hit we started out we launched it was complete cloud cover a little windy um really nice morning for getting a big one it felt good and i think you know once again if we would have had that motor we might have been able to capitalize a little bit more but we yeah we did we did well you got you got the limit I got two fish in the boat in the morning and, um, the bike I guess died. I'll go talk about, uh, the, the switch made and I'm, I'm still not sure how much that color switch like really made a difference, but I feel like it did. Cause I know Vic was throwing straight bone all day and caught him all day long. Um, but at least for me, for a confidence thing, it definitely did help. Um, but yeah, in the morning, at the, I'd started off with, man, I wish I had it, but it's a natural color painted taxi shad, 10 inch. Um, it's like a green gizzard color. And uh, just throwing that around, I was, Thomas was getting his streaming equipment set up and rigging up all his tackle at the same time so i'm running the boat That's about and right. uh, 
I pulled pulled into this uh, ditch at the very end of the mouth of this creek. You know, it leads back into a spawning flat. And um, I was I didn't really see anything on live scope. I was like, I know there's got to be there's there's some fish in here somewhere sitting here on the end. Uh, I threw that thing out there, and sure enough, this blob comes up and just and comes right up on it and i'm working it it's just on it on it on it on it on it that that was a big fish um that's awesome didn't hit it and we pull we just keep pulling back into this cove into this flat and uh thomas finally gets all his stuff together and he starts throwing his swim jig around catching fish so i'm like all right let's i'm gonna just keep I threw around a spinnerbait for a little bit, but he was doing so well on the swim, like, why even bother? Um, so I picked that, I picked the big bait back up, and uh, we come around the corner and out onto this little main lake flat that's got a bunch of random wood on it, and I made a color switch. I switched from that natural color to an all bone one that I had. Um, and I'd never even swam it before I had made it as like a backup back in the fall when I was going to Anna a bunch and never, never test swam it or anything. And, um, it's like, yeah, I don't even know if this is going to swim through and out. Sure enough, it swam good. And, uh, it was like, I don't know, five cats later, Thomas has the video. I smoked literally right beside the boat. I was like, okay, here we go. And then sure enough, we come around, the wind's blowing on everything, just perfect. Everything's tingling. God, this is good. Something's going to happen. And bomb out like over 18 foot of water off this main lake point jump 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 don't got smoke, like clockwork and uh and that was and so we're rolling at this point thomas is freaking out yes he's never <laughs> seen I, I saw how he is when you catch him <laughs> uh, yeah that's yeah yeah i get very emotional it's good footage it's good footage awesome and that's how so, i get too uh, I'm, I'm i'm like screaming yeah. when i catch a good one or i need a high five give me something you know <laughs> yeah. yeah got to that's when i was like this is good we're, it, we're gonna do something here and then it was, yeah it was crazy like, and then just want to let everyone know uh joining us also here is matt allen uh we got mccluskey right here he's on the far left so truck Oh my God! You shaved. What oh, happened? Yeah. Hey. Well, what? we had such. A, we didn't do too good in the first tournament, so we had to switch something up. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I'm gonna make this. I'm gonna add this, Hunter. Here you go, Hunter. You're in real quick. Say hi. What up, and dog? Oh, Hunt, God, Hunter. A, oh my God! He's at the show. <laughs> Goodbye, Hunter. Okay. Oh, that's, that's the <laughs> Is that a concert? Oh, that's oh, okay. So we got a, we got a question here back on the fishing thing. Uh, what's the water clarity on the res like? Clear, muddy, or extra muddy? Um, in in it's, general, it's like like in, on average, uh, like on a good day, it's probably up to two feet, three feet. But recently, it's been pretty muddy. I mean, yesterday it was actually clearer than I thought it would be because of all that rain we got. Um, it's been pretty muddy recently so which i don't it doesn't really affect my fishing i actually like more muddy water sometimes anyway so especially this time of year <laughs> what is your favorite yeah, pretty, uh oh go ahead no it's pretty muddy like stefan was saying i mean it's to everybody's surprise yesterday morning we all got to the ramp we're like oh my god you can see more than the foot so it was pretty surprising, but yeah, it's been pretty muddy. Yeah. Well, 
Well, Matt, what did you think about your performance? I mean, you finally, I, mean, I know it's not up to your standards of second place with 30 plus pounds, but I mean, did, dude, 30 pounds, I don't care what place we got. It was a fun day and it was a good, good redemption from the first one. I mean, the first one we still had 21, but it was just, I don't know, just couldn't get it, couldn't get it together. It was a frustrating day, made bad decisions, had bad timing, felt like we were fishing behind people. And like this tournament, I didn't see a boat until 11 o'clock. So it just, every, everything clicked yesterday. You talked about redemption. Is it, yeah. beca is it because of the weight you caught or is it because of the decision you made? If you made the decisions the way you did and you caught 20 pounds, like you made the decisions exactly the way you wanted to and you caught that same weight, would you be saying that? Or is it specifically just because you caught 21 pounds, therefore the day was bad? If that I mean, makes it's sense. Both. It, it's both. I mean, I feel like if we had executed and made good decisions with the fish that were biting the first turn, the first day, like this last tournament, we could have had more weight. And it just, I mean, you can't be disappointed with 21 pounds. It's fountainhead, so it's a little different, but it's, I don't know. It just, it, 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 it was just unsettling driving home. For you, I'm, McCluskey, yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, it's just, I, I, I saw, I saw three or two seven pounders get caught right in front of me on the first tournament. So it was, it was pretty devastating <laughs> and doing the same stuff we were doing. It's like, everybody's going down the bank with spinner bait and a chatter bait and a whatever flipping. And we're doing the same shit. It's just couldn't get it, couldn't get it going. So it was just frustrating. But all right. We have a, it's all good. We have a spicy comment here uh, from John uh, Hudgens. Hudgens, I think. Matt and Alex have made a concentrated effort to exploit water above Fountainhead. 100%. I mean, it's just, we, we wanted to go down like yesterday, yesterday, but it just, we were one of the last boats to go out and there goes eight boats down lake. I was like, let's just fish around here for a little bit. I was wondering, I was wondering if that was you. I was like, because I told, I told Jim, my partner, I was like, I think that's McCluskey over there. Because, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the slowest boat, so I'm behind everybody. And <laughs> I'm used to you going up. I mean, I'm, I'm used to you going down lake with everybody. So I was like, huh, that's odd. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I mean, we have a pretty slow boat, too. I mean, we're able to get on plane after, like, a half mile of running. But it's just, like, I didn't see – that's part of the reason we messed up in the first tournament, got out of the comfort zone. So I was like, let's just stay around here and get our, get settled and then go up lake a little bit. And then as we went up lake, the water got considerably muddier. So we kind of, we just spent pretty much the majority of the day within a mile of the ramp. That's what Phil and I thought. That was our strategy going into it, honestly. Like, let's I know, not, man. Like, let's not drop the hammer. <laughs> you got, you got, you had so many options of places to run. <laughs> uh, we haven't. <laughs> oh my god john johnny has a great question here and we were talking about this on our private chat earlier today is why doesn't fountainhead not let you put in a bass boat so so that i think let me back up on that one they do let you put in a bass boat you there there was um unless somebody recently was denied but a little bit after the pandemic happened there was like new management there that uh, they started denying any bass boat there even if they said hey i'm only going to use trolling motor because they, they ended up denying me and i had to go turn around and go launch somewhere else a few times um but uh to my knowledge i mean i've been i've been launching there even before i put my 99 kicker on i've been launching there quite frequently just fine and i've been talking to the people who work there so i think that kind of they were they, there was like a year or so they were not letting people with bass boats um that didn't have a nine nine on there. They weren't letting them launch, but I think you're you're good to go now. Phil, I had did, a buddy yeah, that went there the other day. He's got a twenty one foot express for the two fifty Yamaha on the back, and they were like, nah. So they had to drive to the other really? ramp. Yeah, yeah I think to, day kind of thing. But I'm pulling the gambler up there Friday. And I think I'm just going to pull the prop off. And if somebody says something, I'm going to be like, look, what am I going to do? Like fire up my prop motor and ruin my lower unit. Like <laughs> that's a smart idea, actually. Yeah. Just go up there. No problem. Maybe, yeah. I but mean, I can, yeah. yeah. You're also, say, you probably are good to go. I mean, yeah. you might be there on off day, but probably not. 
Sorry, Thomas, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, but you're also depending that the people that are looking at the boat understand how any of that works. So I, I don't know. Some of these people these, that manage these places I, have no clue. I'm not driving two hours to not be able to launch my boat. I'll, <laughs> you'll be fine. Did you say you're going tomorrow, yeah. Phil? Uh, Friday. Oh, Friday. Okay. Cause I'm going to be out there with Scylla tomorrow. My original oh, tournament nice. partner is, um, is Scylla, but she had to get carpal tunnel surgery on her hand. So that's why, um, she wasn't with me the first few, but she's going to come out tomorrow to try to practice with me and hopefully we'll be there in the next tournament. Oh, is yeah. Scylla going to play with you? Yeah. She's my, she's, she's my original partner. Yeah. Oh, dang. That's awesome. Yeah. It's also where tell, I keep my boat, which is like time. really convenient. Wait, yeah, where does Scylla live? So she lives like five minutes from Bull Run Marina. So that's why like after work, yeah. I'll just like head because I keep my boat at her place. So I'll just like head to her place right after work because I get off at like 3.30. Um, head straight to her place. So I'm there by like four. I get to like launch on the reservoir by like 4.15, you know, at Bull Run Marina. Um, and I'll, I'll launch at like the Who's Run launch to near uh, my friend James's place as well. Mm -hmm. That was mentioned earlier. But That's it's like really five cool. minutes yeah yeah it's real convenient so she's a great she, friend for, for catches, letting me do that she catches hey. them yeah she, yeah that's why i was like <laughs> hey you, you interested in doing the the fountainhead bass club tournaments with me and she was like hell yeah um it was unfortunate she just had to get surgery on her hand but she's gonna come out with yeah. me tomorrow and hope she said she's gonna try to brace and just practice with me and see how it goes so i'm hoping that it's gonna go well and then she can join me um i think april 7th is the next tournament in two weeks yeah Huge shout out uh, to her. I've had her on the show, I think twice, once. I've had her on the show a couple of times. It's starting to get together. She also did the live stream. That's what it was uh, for the kayak show. Um, we have on Instagram, StreamYard, could you get your shit together so I can share stream, uh, Instagram comments? But we have not Seth Fishing Boy, not Seth Fish Boy. I'm following <laughs> Phil across the lake all day. <laughs> That's a good idea. Because he's going to catch them all. <clears throat> And then oh, we have, man. let's see, we have another question on here. Uh, McCluskey, that's boring. We'll just call you Mick Rib. What is your favorite baits to throw this time of year? I, uh, I mean, Mega Bass Vision 110 plus one is definitely at the top of the list. Oh, you need, you need the plus one, though. No, oh, I got I got, I got got the plus one and the plus two. No worries. <laughs> no, nah, yeah, that one's definitely top of the list for me. But um, spinnerbait, chatterbait flat-sided crankbait or square bill in general was good but this year i can't get buy a bite on a crankbait um flipping alex was wrecking them on a jig in the morning yesterday um that about covers i mean Power. alabama rig sometimes in the this time of year normally it's good but just with the muddy water and where the, the fish are all and not where you need to throw an alabama rig so yeah, and I was gonna say like Thomas, you were talking earlier about like you love to throw the swim jig when you you're not you're coming in behind somebody and like fishing a spot behind people and you feel like that's like your confident comfort. bait. Yeah. Yeah, comfort bait or whatever. Like I was gonna say, so mine that I go to, even though I'm like a really big bait kind of guy and I love swim baits, you know, I do I do use small stuff and uh as well. But this time of year I don't really go with like, you know, soft plastics much. Um and I like Cinco's or anything, but what if I am going to use a soft plastic, I like these, um, like small paddle tails. These are Kytex. yeah, yeah, the uh, easy shiner three inch. They also come in like a two and a half inch as well, I think. Um, and I think even Strykel came out with a video not long ago, you know, using these in winter and catching them as well. But he uses a uh, a ball head mustad hook, so it's kind of like almost like a Demiki rig style. But I like to use these core tackle uh hmm. they're called tush hooks so they are called like this stands for the ultimate swim bait hook so if you guys see here uh, i know maybe some of you already know about this but for those of you who That's don't your... yeah it's like lead the lead is going down a certain way the hook so like the, the lead will go inside inside the actual swim bait or the little whatever you want to call it and so it, it swims differently so instead of having just like the paddle move to swim the whole body of the the whole body of the bait is going to like wobble back and forth. So that lead being designed like that kind of gives it like a different unique style of fishing that I feel like the fish ha still haven't seen much of yet. So 
they also come out with that that hover rig which i love in the, the summer i don't catch much on the res with that but i think i i just need to practice more with it but the hover rig by core tackle i've definitely been enjoying as well um but yeah this time of year if i'm if i'm throwing anything soft plastic it'll just be like something like this i'm in a just like slow roll it or medium retrieve like seven three one gear ratio but other than that they're all like hard like plastic um jerk baits swim bait spinner bait kind of like what mccluskey was just saying yeah and this place has a t like an ungodly amount of wood and so when you're fishing stuff like a crank i think i broke off like two crankbaits when i was trying to throw crankbaits <laughs> um there which I, I lost all my bandits my good colored bandits too which really sucks for the potomac river um but that's why i went with this with like the swim jig and this is not like my bluegill imitator like i don't know just for like like reference here like it's this is a big ass one because it's just it's a weed it's a weedless swim bait is all a swim jig is and so if you're thinking about a swim jig i think you think about the the potomac river and how you fish it there a swim jig in a lake is completely different i think how you fish it it's just a mm -hmm. slow bottom bumping thing and when you break away from cover you just let it glide down and i think what happens is just like with the glide they're sharking it and it hits something and then they're going to just they're going to slack line you is, is generally yeah. how that works there but again like yeah you, you can really fish your strengths there which is interesting i, I just wonder do fish get conditioned? Because when I have seven people come up to me, it's like, it's that red kicker spinner bait or whatever. And it's like, well, at some point, those fish, I mean, unless it's SB's nine pounder, because that thing's retarded as hell, has been caught like nine times. But eventually, they're going to get conditioned to these things, right? Like, I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not so sure. I don't. There are a of five pounders in that lake that is nothing like I've ever seen. Yeah, I just, I mean, yeah. a, re, a a spinner bait like that and like a specific color type thing is usually for a specific condition. Like we've had this, this year, this, the first couple of tournaments have been an anomaly with what the water clarity looks like, the water temperature, how, where the fish are. Like, I just, you can throw that in a normal spring and still catch fish, but when they're really keyed on something, I feel like it kind of just goes in cycles. Like next year, they might not, not bite that exactly. particular bait particular exactly. bait good but that doesn't mean they're conditioned to it it just means they don't want to eat it that's kind of my mindset too like that's what i think as well i'm not so sure it's like a a human driven thing that's like affecting them i think it's just they're they don't want that type of that bait right now they just they're wanting something else they're in a different type of behavior and depending on so many other variables like environment and weather all that type of stuff so i, I also add to that more as like adding to it than taking away from it as it looks like uh, there you go, Phil. Th thank you. Um, I think it's like they can get conditioned to vibration. You saw this a lot with like lipless baits on the Potomac. I know this is like a very like niche specific example, but if everyone's throwing a one knocker, it doesn't take long for those fish to be like, I am not hitting anything that sounds like that shit because it, it, it hurts when I bite that thing. And I wonder with that, uh, and then we got <laughs> Ross again. Could could you? This was the thing of the show, honestly. Could you show off that megalodon uh, spinnerbait again? Yeah, that was wild. I mean, it looks like a flutter spoon that you just hot wire onto the spinnerbait. Well, we, he fishes a place that has fish in it that will eat that, oh, and, and way bigger baits. Yeah, I mean the oh. fish yesterday. I mean, oh. it wasn't the great four and a half pounder that did make my day, but I'm. I'm going to catch another even bigger one on it. I, oh. I'm going to keep throwing it. I only untied it to show it on the show, but it's going right back on online, right? Do you use a stinger hook on that or trailer? I don't No, It actually, so it came with a stinger hook. They they come with like a feather stinger hook, um, but it, it casted like right off third cast or something like that. Um, but it, McCluskey, this is from Juan. Actually, this is from Juan, Juan Duran. I, <laughs> so, I, I was with him while I was driving. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Juan, Juan's always got the sneaky JDF stuff, and yeah, I don't show me so many baits. I'm like, that just looks so weird. And I take him out, and he catches a five pounder on it. It's like, okay, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but those for those who asked, so this is a size 15 Jesus. spinner blade. So again, <laughs> camera is not doing it justice. But you can, um, I mean, it doesn't have to be the jack. Like this is the jackal, but I think any big blade spinner baits. Um, like I think Burrow, Burrow's tackle.com, they sell up to like size nine or 10. I used to get those like the gold and the silver willows. And so I would switch out my blades in spring and fall on just like, just like a regular one ounce or even quarter ounce spinner bait. I'll switch out the willow blade on it and put like a huge blade and you can just feel the pull in the water, which I think really attracts the, 
the fish certain at certain times. They they need that pull, especially also murky water when you know the the res is not the clearest. It's it's more it's known as a murky known as a more murky place compared to others. So and then especially after it rains, it's gonna be just all blown out. Like having those huge blades, you know. I mean, yeah, I fish those swim baits a lot, but having these huge blades just like really draws those those big bass in. I feel so. Yeah, look into size fifteen. Hey, how does this place affect you? Now that I've seen it and, and I've seen you know heaven, how does it affect <laughs> you when you go to places like you know? And I make the joke that with that blade there, it's basically the size of all the fish we catch up here on the Ohio River, which is the Upper Potomac. I get conditioned and I see everyone says like the Ned rig Tom's through a Ned rig all day, which you're not completely off on that. <laughs> um, you get used to fishing that way. And when you go from like, I'm used to, to dinking and dunking for a bunch of 12 inches to this, it's shocking. But on the flip side, if you're throwing a spoon that looks like the shrapnel tip for a 50 caliber round, how, how does that play when you're like, I have to go to Lake Anna now. Do you have to really change the way your, your mind works when you go to places that aren't this awesome fishery? Totally. Um, and I don't mean to cut in but between uh, Matt or Phil, but um, like I, I, I do some Phil's tournaments alive. on. <laughs> I do some tournaments um, actually on Lake Anna with with my friend Curtis, um, like the Sunday morning series sometimes, like in the summer and the fall as well. And I don't really do well there, but coming from like that that mindset, yeah, like I'll I'll make sure that I have like nine rods on the boat sometimes there, pretty much every style, you know, tied on so that I try to figure out what the fish are wanting there at the time. So, I mean, as to answer your question is I kind of go in with an open mindset and just try to figure it out from there. Um, yeah. Do, do you, all of you, I mean, Phil, I know that you're all, all you throw is baits that are over 12 inches, but for, uh, M Mr. McCluskey, um, and th you already stated like your thoughts on it. Do you feel like you have to pare down your viewpoint on things and you're like, all right, well, this place doesn't have all six pounders. So I need to dial it back. Or do you yeah. still try to play it? I mean, you have to be realistic where you go. I mean, where you go, most places, you know, you know, kind of the caliber of fish you're fishing for. There's a lot of places around us that have the same caliber, not as many, but, um, yeah, I mean, the, I, I went fishing this afternoon. I got back to, Oh no. Did I cut out? No, you're here now. You're still there. Uh, uh, yeah, I went to a place just outside of Roanoke and it's a deep, clear reservoir and I caught some nice fish, but it wasn't like, you just have to be realistic. Like a three pounder is a good fish, but on Fountainhead, you do not want that in your live well at the end of the day. Does that make you more so, depressed? You know, like how rock stars become like suicidal and drug addicts because they can't get the high of being on stage. Like if you're not fishing Fountainhead, do you feel like you got to chase that high somewhere else? Like fishing is just not the same. No, it's just still fishing. I mean, we're all just chasing a little tiny green fish, so it doesn't matter where you. It doesn't matter where you do it, but I mean, it's just it's it's special. So I mean, like I said, you just have to be realistic. Like going to Anna, I know that I'm probably not going to catch as many fish. I mean, Anna's got big fish, and you can have awesome days out there. But I mean, you're probably not going to go catch 20 fish over three pounds. After watching that live stream again, when I was editing out some of the uh, the gamer words that were used by me. I really realized like one thing that made that so special is it was like a 25 pound bag. And with everything I've dealt with, that is a big bag, even if it was six fish and, and Phil and, and the way when you caught that absolute kicker, Phil, you called your shot on that tree while I was screwing with the camera. It's still a big bag. And then you come into weigh in and somebody's like, yawn, we have 48 or some crazy ass number. Mm -hmm. It's still insane to think that we caught that amount of weight and, and maybe you get numb to it. I think that's the thing that's almost like, depressing about this place is some of the guys are always in the top. It's like, yeah, it's 30 pounds. It's no big deal. That's only an eight. You know, come on. It's like, holy oh. shit. <laughs> it's, it's still a big deal. I mean, an eight pounder, seven pounder, whatever. It's, it's still a big deal. Like, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. only two sevens. Like whatever, you know, somebody, <laughs> somebody weighed in a seven, the guy who won weighed in a seven, 70 and like a six ninety nine, and had the rest were all five pounds. It's just like the, the, Three of the top four biggest bags weighed in in Fountainhead history got weighed in in the last two weeks. When we started the show, and then don't worry, guys, we're going to be talking about, um, I'm going to get to all your questions here before we end the show. When you look at this with like uh, the teams, I'm going to pull this up, I guess, just to reshare re this for everyone. Here we go. Um, it's interesting, like the swings, like 
you know, with, with Jackson and and Alderman, you know, 35, you're going to 22, at 20 to 35, you guys 21 to 33, 28 to 20, like, what's missing usually in these days? Is it just one bite or is it just a pattern difference? Is it because pattern. they just were, pattern? Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's pattern difference. I mean, it's just not not finding, getting that one key bite that keys you in on something and then you miss it for the rest of the day. Phil, what do you think? <laughs> Don't ask me. We <laughs> came in and made something happen one time. I can't, I can't speak against, I don't know. I don't want to, I just sound like a lawyer. No, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think you know more than you let on. I mean, yeah, you do the whole Shane, I drink Budweiser thing, but you look like, oh, Bob Ross on the front of that boat with this retarded thing. And by the way, has your friend retired yet with how many of these fucking things he's sold <laughs> for that lake? I mean, good Lord. No, <laughs> much money. <laughs> I think he, he just bought it, sold a couple more yesterday. <laughs> yeah, didn't get a new yeah. boat. Yeah, it got an express. Oh, that was his the... boat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, not my not my other buddies. My other buddies got a brand new twenty one foot express, but Vic got a like a eighteen foot white. Express with uh, had a random. It's stick. Like an electric sick. motor or something. Was it an electric motor? Like in the yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he's he's got to keep slinging them baits. I wonder if they're gonna get conditioned to these glide baits ever too. Like I, I still say that because I think eventually these bigger fish got to get conditioned to something. Bigger fish in general. Um, we got so many it, questions here. Oh, I I don't think they will. No. I don't think they do because we've like fishing those reservoirs up around Baltimore with Vic. Like it's the same every year. And he's been fishing those places with a glide bait way more like fishing them way harder than most people fish conventional for years now. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, think, I think it's like more like what also what Matt was saying. Like, I mean, this is all just theory, right? But like, yeah. just kind of like what Matt McCluskey was just saying. Like, it's I, I really do believe it's it's more of like environmental conditions that would would change a bass's behavior and the way they feed more than just you know I, somebody's baits coming in the water. But you know what what do we know? I mean, it's fun to talk about these theories, but I, I I'm definitely like I feel like it's it's. They don't really condition. I mean, unless you have like a pet bass in an aquarium and you're, <laughs> you're really like have, you know, yeah. hang on top of it. Other than that, I, I don't, I think it's more of an environmental um, conditions that are really changed up these variables for the way they feed. I think if something yeah, is very was, sound based. Oh, I'm sorry, Phil, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I was having a conversation about that with uh, my muskie fishing buddy the other day. And of course this is, muskies and they're totally different creatures but uh, a lot of stuff still applies like it's like every year there's like one or three baits that just do better and nobody knows why nobody sam scott couldn't tell you why they, they, they just like last year on the shenandoah the bucktail just worked better yep. for some reason there's no there's and, and that's like the most thrown musky bait of all time it it just worked nobody knows why it just worked and you know this year it might be the single piece glide or whatever so i i think there's things that like we may never really know that kind of dictate those bites I tend to think when it has something that affects their lateral line more than anything else, it's easier for a quote unquote conditioning to happen. And I just see this with smallmouth. I fish so many smallmouth my whole life in clear water where they will analyze the shit out of something before making a decision. And so yeah. they're making thoughts there. I must gear that way too. They're visual predators. And 
I think a bait like this, where it's got the profile of what they want to eat, and you can make this thing look like it's gonna it's something they want to eat. It's a lot harder for them to like to get conditioned, quote unquote. But if it is a jackhammer, a whopper plopper, a lipless bait, where they hear that thing for a long time coming at them, I think there is a potential where they do get pressured by it. Not just the one bait, but this blew my mind when I was fishing back, at fishing BFLs and ABAs out of Matter Woman, and everyone would be slinging a lipless bait. Um, this is before the jackhammer really, the chatterbait took off. And you could feel where, like when everything just got pushed down. Now, could that be because of the boat pressure? 100%. When you have 38 boats throwing rattle traps, and it probably sounds like Vietnam with all the choppers going off over their head, that's, it has to do something to their lateral line where they know, like, I shouldn't eat right now. And that's when you started to see like the jack, the, the jackhammer chatterbait really kick off. When you saw silent stuff, like silent lipless baits really kick off. I, I don't know. Like th that's just my thought there. Like it's something to do with the lateral line and how it feels hitting them. And they kind of, kind of cue into maybe that's not what they want to do, but I love to hear people in the comment section too, about that as well. Um, let's see. Yeah, I never we even, have, I was gonna oh, say, go I never it, even it. thought of it that way. And you kind of just opened up my mind about that. Like I've, I've never even thought of it that way. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, uh, so actually, so I don't think you guys even know. I'm a behavior analyst. That's what I do for work. I uh, I analyze behavior, <laughs> but I, I work with children with special needs um, and people with disabilities. But being a behavior analyst, you know, I've come to like analyze behavior of just everything like throughout my environment and in my life. And really what you kind of just said, Thomas, just makes sense because, you know, I mean, the fish, yeah, they're just fish and their brains are probably about the size of a pea. But um, if you think about it, they're still engaging in behavior because they're either being reinforced for it or they're not engaging in behavior because they're being punished for it, if that makes sense. So if yeah. your fish is like a, a, a good, good quality fish. So let's say like, cause bass, we know they grow pretty slowly. So like if a bass has been around for five, six years, I mean, it's going to be in its teens, like 17 inches or so. So that bass is probably, I'm sure has yeah, gone in tune to some maybe certain vibrations and sounds, uh, at a certain point. Um, and if it keeps being caught, like every time it hears that, and then it, it's being caught and being pulled out of the water and whatever it's feeling, um, it's it's not being reinforced for it being caught, right? It's being punished for it being caught. So I think over time, if it's going to still be caught over and over with that same vibration, yeah, it may it may be learning. It may learn to like, okay, you know what? That means punishment and not reinforcement. Uh, so coming from a behavior analyst type of point of view, you totally made sense. Um, so good theory. And I also, the reason that I really feel this more now than ever before is when I went out with Matt Allen, um, you know, McCluskey, and he shined the cancer ray at so many fish and the bigger ones would turn. There was a reaction. And he even talked like when we were smallmouth fishing up, I think it was like at Riverton. Riverton's a lot shallower than where I fish on the upper Potomac at Big Slack. Big Slack, it's like 20 and 30 feet of water to where you can Demiki rig dead nuts underneath the boat. And if you're not doing that, you're not catching them. Riverton's not that deep. And I was getting my butt kicked trying to do the same thing. And he was like, well, they can feel that ray. Well, that's their lateral lines. So if they can fear the cancer beam, can they feel different baits that have that same kind of pulsing and, and get memorized to it? I, I don't know. I don't know. Some interesting theories there with yeah. that. Um, yeah. I, I know some people in the audience get bored with this stuff. So let's get to a better question. We got Andy. Andy says, what is everyone's PB? Uh, go for it. Who wants to go first? Uh, I'll go first. I, so I've actually caught my PB three times. So I've tied it twice. It's a seven pound, 15 ounce. So one ounce away from eight pounds, but I've caught three, seven pound, 15 ounces. And yes, I've uh, checked my scale. The scale was, <laughs> the scale was okay. <laughs> uh, let's go. Uh, hey. Oh my gosh. You're next. Me? Uh, so the biggest bass I've ever caught was in a private place and it was 1056. Was it and a Bass Pro Shop Aquarium? No, I mean, basic, <laughs> basic, basically. But um, honestly, it was really tough the day we went, actually. It was like we didn't catch anything. And then I went with uh, Billy. Phil? Oh no. Oh, there he is. Oh, Matt, your, your audio went out. Refresh, refresh. We're going to come back to your story here in a minute. Phil, you're up. You got me now? Yep. I got you now. There. 
Sorry. No, uh, but we didn't catch anything all day. And then Billy caught a nine pounder. And then like tw- 10 minutes later, I caught that big one. But um, the biggest one I've caught on public water, which is, I, I think it's my PB because it was, it wasn't in a private place, but it was 10.02 okay. or something like that. That's freaking awesome. Phil? That went is a zoo. Um, I don't even know. I, I, I don't know what my PB is. It's like, I have a curse of like not being able to break out of the high sixes. So I kind of stopped weighing fish. Uh, that I wish I would have weighed that one in the tournament. I don't think it went seven, but it was getting up there. Um, but yeah, it's like really high six. I've caught, I've caught like an eight pounder in Florida, but that doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Um, Biggest yeah. was almost nine pounds. It was about nine pounds uh, from Sleater's Lake. Um, oh yeah, I remember. Yeah, five or six. I was I was young. I was like seventeen, and yeah, that one was. I saw a bigger one there too, and that's when I got into the swim bait thing. I didn't do glides. I got into like the bluegill stuff, and so like the rod that that Phil broke of mine it was not Phil. It was Phil's bait. It was a it's called Matt lures, I guess. And they make custom bluegill stuff. And I had one that looked like a submarine come up to it and turn away. Never, never got him to eat, but good. Yep. Well, this is the Matt lures meathead. It's not the bluegill, but I love Matt lures, um, some baits, but I know the gill that you're talking about. Um, this is one I was going to showcase today. I actually, a uh, uh, wake bait when the water is over 50 degrees on the Occoquan reservoir, if it's in his fifties, I'll throw like a wake bait below the surface. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, Matt lures is good. Dude, that's deadly. And I like to also take, um, and there's something there. I did this with the Buka one too, is you take uh, a Sharpie, uh, the chartreuse and really Sharpie that tail a little bit. Cause this is what I do. Like with, if I'm doing like a bluegill swim jig, it's just to get those tips to have that color to them. Because I don't know why chartreuse turns like bluish in the water, but it does depending on the water you're fishing and bluegill have that like hue of like yellow or blue on the, on the tip of the tail. And so putting that on like a, a bluegill swim bait or even a wake bait for some reason, it just gives them something else to like key in on to, to start sharking the bait for you. So that's a, that's a neat little tip there as well. Yeah, I um, do that as well. I, uh, there's like the garlic pens. They have the garlic, I have like garlic markers and then they also have the garlic dip. You just get it at Walmart. Um, just dip the little paddle tail in it and whenever you use a paddle tail. How did you get into fishing and psychoanalysis? Cause it's, is this the room that you teach kids in? Cause there's a lot of dead animals in it. <laughs> no, actually. So I used to work with children uh, with special needs, like in their homes. Um, and I just do like, it's called applied behavior analysis, basically the science of behavior. Um, so I'd be giving behavior therapy sessions to children with special needs and autism, um, just helping them have better lives basically. Uh, and actually it's funny because um, one of like my best friends from fishing, uh, it was his girlfriend who was a behavior analyst saw that how good I was like working with kids, um, you know, introduced me to the world of special education. Um, so it was actually through fishing that I ended up having a career of working with, with children with special needs. Um, but yeah, I used to work with them in their homes, but now I work in the school system. So, um, I'm I sorry. work for the, the Fairfax County public schools. <laughs> hey, no, actually I love it. I I'm loving it. Cause you know, working with kids in their homes, I'd have to wait till they got af- out after school. So it'd be like 3.30 to like 9 p.m. Like when I wanted to go fishing, right? <laughs> so it was hard. But now that I switched to the school system, I'm, I'm off by like 3.30 p.m. It's great. It gives me like all that time to go fishing. I'm not married. I don't have kids. You are living the life. Uh, marriage <laughs> is not always what it's cracked up to be. But uh Free. Anyway. Anyway, uh, yeah, she's not listening to this. Uh, ag- agreed, Thomas. Uh, they can be conditioned to the vibration. The lateral line is one of the key receptors, especially in murky water. A hundred percent. I want to get through all these because we have been doing. Dave Smith, Dave, I need to get you back on the show. He's got the best crankbait collection, the best crankbait collection in God's earth. I don't know what that first word is there. Uh, so the, bal- the-, the Balthuses. Thank you, <laughs> the Balthuses team had 29.95 last week and all six were caught by a 15 year old Bad bait. and he caught them all on a big swim bait that's yep. freaking awesome that kid is, is a, a stick. 
That's yeah, all. He was I, talking about um Wyatt. Yeah, Wyatt. Such a great freaking like. I got Jeremy again. Sorry, my comment cut off. I was saying we have some great electric only small impoundments in Southwest Virginia that have some big ones. A hundred percent. And then also, uh, I think one of the longest episodes I've done in a while is about, I think it was like three hours, but I cut it down to like two and a half with Chaz, who just won the Alpha Elite solo on Kerr. And we talked about for about 30 minutes all the lakes down in the Norfolk area. We really need to get somebody on just to specifically talk about them because there's so many cool lakes down there that you could fish. It's just so hard for the because you just need specific boats. And like again, like one reason that took me so long to fish Fountainhead myself is I do have a ranger. And it just kind of I feel like like Frederick can sometimes be too big for just an electric motor, like a trolling motor to sit on the front of your deck, but it's such a great lake. It's I see why people buy a boat specifically for it. It's so addicting. Uh, let's see getting through all these questions here uh how much for the person's name that i apologize but i will not try to pronounce because well, I, I, I do have disabilities how he's much my, does the uh, colors matter yeah. <laughs> so he's saying how much does color matter i yes i believe it, it can matter on some days and some days not like you know on finicky days like color a color change does make a difference or if you're th throwing a certain color that like, that's what's going to trigger the bites um and then some days i feel like color doesn't matter so it's just so variable i don't I, know if yeah. i made phil sit on a mountaintop and think about god because of a color thing that happened with us um i, I don't i think for smallmouth and spotted bass it's a hundred percent like the shit it has to be color largemouth i'm kind of like if i didn't see that 15 pounder just come up to his bait and roll over it i wouldn't have been as much of a a big deal about it but he made the switch and i thought it did matter it yeah. definitely seemed like it, yeah what i always say with color is basically what stefan said is it doesn't matter until it does <laughs> like which the part that i absolutely hate the most about it because i hate switching baits and i hate the game of like trying to switch between different colors and figuring out what's working, what's not working. It just introduces so many more variables to your decision-making process, it does. but yeah. And, but the nice place about the res is, or nice thing about the res is, you know, it's stays dirty and it's a little bit more forgiving than, you know, North Fork of the Shenandoah where you can see the bottom of the river, the entire way to Riverton. <laughs> Good yeah. point. Yeah, good point. I think that like the clearer the water, you then you I think you need to start thinking about color more, right? Like, um, but yeah, with the with especially talking about the res, like I, focus of this this show, um, as far as the reservoir, it's it's known as like a dirty place in general. So I I think yeah, color is not so much um thing. But again, I I on some days it is like especially like those clear. So like if you go up like up lake near near Bull Run where the water starts getting really clear, um. And you're, you're talking about like those hot summer dog days. Like I make sure I have like a, a right color jig, either the white or the back, black and blue with chartreuse, something like that. I don't, I don't just throw anything. I think another thing that I, I've gotten to interview way more crappie guys this year, I'm, I'm actually kind of following the Richmond crappie circuit. And what's so interesting about them is before their mindset is before they switch the style of bait, they switch color first. And that's what I'm trying to do more this year. I, I kind of make a little list of things I want to do in, in that tournament. I switched my swim jig color a couple of times before I was going to go off of the swim jig. And I finally got the right color pattern with that sheet white one. And I think that's interesting that as fishermen, our mindset for, for a lot of anglers is I'm going to switch the bait before I switch the color. And that's such an interesting thing. It's like if the chatter bait's not working, clearly I'm going to go to something else versus like, well, what if it's just the color scheme? That's the issue. Um, I don't know. That's interesting. The guy, I, I recorded an episode. I hasn't dropped yet with the guy that actually won the co-angler side on Smith Mountain Lake. And he was throwing a chatterbait and it was a white one. And it was like halfway through the day, it's like it was glowing too much, he said in his head. And he switched to a green pumpkin one and he ended up catching like, a, I think it was like a five pound kicker. But in his head, he said like, it just looks too bright now. And instead of switching baits, he said like, well, Jack Hammers apparently catch big fish. So I want to stick with that. So he made the color switch and immediately he was rewarded. I don't know. I just, it's interesting when this stuff pops up and then I think in my head, like how many instances did I not probably do it correctly? Let's see. Oh, we got a great question for all the swim bait guys that I am not. 
Andrew Redding says, when do you choose to pick up a glide bait versus a hollow belly? If you're Phil, you never pick up a hollow belly. But anyway, thoughts? I don't. It's, <laughs> I need to pick up the soft swim baits more. I, I have you. a bunch. And I've caught really big fish on the South Fork on soft swim baits uh this time of year doing specific things but it's so hard for me to put that glide bait down because i know what i'm doing with it and i to throw it and i know where to throw it and i just didn't i haven't never got the experience you know really throwing hollow bellies or whatever but i don't know maybe mccluskey will be able to speak more on that i'm i'm really not the guy to talk about hollow bellies <laughs> i mean hollow belly i mean i've thrown it on the res yeah i mean if we're talking like legit hollow belly i don't know if he's talking about just the soft plastic over a glide but a hollow belly i mean i just i haven't really thrown them too much i mean i throw them in the summertime very rarely but it's uh if we're talking just soft bodied swim baits i mean i like the glide more because it doesn't sink fast and you got more time to mess with it and mess with the fish if you're yep. scoping um i mean the eight inch mag draft works works great and just bring them both i if, personally i will yeah. say if, if i know the fish are not wanting to come up off the bottom then that is when I'll start to be like, okay, we need to throw something with a beast hook in it or a jig exactly. hook. That's, that's what I was going to say. It's like, I was, I was thinking like, I'm going to look at my graphs and, and try to determine where, where is that bait fish? Like are bait fish more towards the top of the column? And if so, that means the bass are probably going to be feeding towards the top. So wake bait, glide bait. And also another reason I don't really want to use like glide baits really in the much in the middle of the water column is because they're expensive and I don't want to get them stuck. Right. So if I see bait, like in the middle of the water column or towards the bottom, or even just bass in general, like, you know, feeding towards the bottom or in the middle of the water column, I'll throw the the soft plastic, not necessarily hollow body, but like, I love like the Huddleston, just there's traditional Huddleston, one of those first swim baits from California, you know, mm -hmm. they've caught me actually my best days I've had on the reservoir with, were with soft plastic Huddleston's sandy run i've caught like two six and a half pounders on the same day in april once and i've had other amazing days with huddleston soft plastic um so yeah it depends i think like for me to answer that question it, it just depends where the where i think the bass are feeding so again more towards the top of well, the water column i'll throw those hard body swim baits but the body yeah. if they're more middle or bottom i'll throw soft this is something i actually have talent in so I can talk to this a little bit. If you're fishing a a legit just a swim bait and you're not doing a shad bite, uh, a shad bite would be like you're just throwing it like a spinner bait and they're on the bottom. You're bottom bumping. You're taking that thing and you're just you're engaging that reel and you're feeling every rock, every piece of gravel, every stump, and you're hitting it with it because you, you usually throw these things where you can't throw a crank bait because you're going to get too snagged up with stuff. And that's basically what a swim jig is or just one with a beast hook like this. This is an American trash fish. You basically can't buy these anywhere because they're so hard to make. Um, but you're going out there, and if they're not going to rise up on a mag draft or a glide, I'm going to throw – and I had a really nice one with Phil on the American trash fish, and I literally set the hook on it, and he shot straight out of the damn water. But the thing was I was counting every stupid tree and rock, and I hit one. And it went slack off the ledge and I held the rod down, held, held the rod up. So it would just pendulum down and then it never hit bottom. And, and when you're fishing a, a swim bait like this, whether it's with the beast hook or this big head here, you want that thing to be hitting on the bottom. And every time it hits, it quivers and the tail does something. And what I like to picture it, picture with it when I see them on, on the scope is they're kind of just sharking it on the bottom until it hits something and it has that secondary action and then it'll flail and then they'll hit. And that's honestly what the underspin was supposed to do. People started to throw the underspin uh, when you get away from this Carolina lakes where you're just cranking it like a spinner bait. But in, in the Carolinas, what you're doing with that thing is you're casting that thing and it's on the bottom like this. And every time it hits, the blade will shine. 
And what will happen is when you go over a lip in like 20 feet of water, it'll fall down that ledge and then the blade will flutter. And so what you're doing is you're just hitting bottom, hitting bottom. Every time you hit a rock, the, the blade will throw up some flash. They're sharking it. And then you go over that lip. And once it falls down that lip and that blade engages, you're going to get trucked by, by a spot. And so with all these baits, whether it's a blade or it has a skirt or it's like an American trash fish with all these stupid like little pendulums and stuff, every time you hit something, it just creates a secondary action to it. And then that's when they're going to key in on and hit it because they're not active. If they were active, they would hit this or a mag draft because they're actually hunting. This stuff is you have to bang into something. You have to crawl it around there and try to get them to engage with you. That's yeah. at least my kind of view with it. But again, this is a four inch, which is stupid for the res. Uh, for ponds, it's great. And I have some nines that they actually make American trash fish that would probably work a little bit better. So I'm hoping to use those next time as well. So I don't know. Hopefully that that answers the question. Another two, Thomas, if I can add. Go for uh, it. I just thought of um, I ran into this and I couldn't tell you exactly why this happens but like sometimes they'll be up shallow and active and but they're not hitting the glide or whatever but if you throw like that huddleston or one that i really like is the burrito gill jig hook gill um burrito baits check them out he makes fantastic baits um either that or there's another series of paddle tails i have in different sizes by a guy named chad yates that are not made anymore that i have a severe stockpile on because they work really really well um i know what you're talking about like yeah. yeah you know yeah, yeah i know yeah. exactly what you're talking about because i'm a, you know I, I make my own soft plastic baits too and and oh, so i know chad uh, from the groups and stuff so i know i think i know exactly what you're talking about his baits <laughs> yeah this, we call it the Shuttleston. But, um, yeah, you fish that thing like a spinner bait up shallow and it can get trucked, like, majorly. These are some of the best swim bait guys around, so just make sure you listen to them. Um, let's see. And then, again, we got two more questions. I think we kind of got them all. Oh, here it is. So he's asking, what's the best budget-friendly glide bait? This is what I believe. It's $25.00. It's the um, 3D Shine Glide Bait by Six Cents. Hmm. Or I'm sorry, Savage Gear. Savage Gear uh, 3D Shine. It's caught me my PB. One of my PB. Like, remember, I caught my PB three times. <laughs> so one of those three, seven pound, 15 ounce, I've caught that on um, on this. And it really, it swims really great. Um, and it comes in different colors as well. I love this Golden Shiner color, but... Um, yeah, this is the Savage Gear 3D Shine Glide. It's seven and a half inch, twenty five dollars. I, I love it. It's one of my favorite. Uh, and it's hard to go budget friendly. I mean, like these here. This is the river, the river to see. My God, my brain's shutting down. This is Phil's bait. This is Phil's secret bait. We'll just call it that. Um, Buka makes uh, the Trick Shad is decent. There's another one Buka makes. I forget. Phil was thinking, yep, yeah, that right there. That worked pretty good for me. Another one Buka makes is absolute crap, I think. Phil, what was the name of that one that I was fishing that didn't move? I don't know what it's called. It's um shit. It's a newer one and it's got an extremely tight joint. I don't know how you're supposed to fish it. I want to get that from you and mess with it. Yeah, I, um, I, 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 as long as you do a review of it, that'd be funny. You're not talking about the herring shad, are you? The herring shad? I don't think so. I don't know. I can't Ooh, keep up no, anymore. No. Um, it's I it's, love, I, like the herring, I love the herring shad. It's like a glide, but except the joints tighter. It's got a oh. super. Um, but. I budget friendly. I used. I started throwing swim baits with the S waiver, pretty much. Let's the go on. one two hundred. I mean, I was actually somebody hit me up. Somebody, uh, a guy I knew from a long time ago, hit me up today, asking about glide baits, and I was telling him that's what got me into it was. Uh, 
a local tackle shop that's not open anymore had some 168s and I bought one and I started throwing it for smallmouth and I saw things that changed my life. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. and also if you're going to be throwing those for smallmouth, better have a parabolic rod, like a really parabolic yeah. rod because otherwise it will throw that thing in a heartbeat. And I lost the tournament one time, lost the by far the biggest mouth I've ever seen in my life. Just threw it right by the boat. So long. I thought it was a channel cat coming up to the boat. Also, I so, will add to that, Phil. If you are a kayak guy, you must have a net when you're throwing trouble hooks. I had a treb almost get me in the scrotum when I tried to just flip it into my lap with triple grip on a Bagley crankbait, um, those things are insanely uncontrollable with treble hooks in their face, especially if you're in a kayak. So, uh, yeah, that's important. Heck. Uh, we and have a, qu uh, go for it, Phil. Fish tournament. Uh, you gotta have a net if you're fishing a kayak tournament. If you're just fun fishing, it doesn't matter as much, but you gotta have somewhere to put that fish to get all your shit situated so you can put it on the bump board and do all that nonsense. Oh, we got so many. Okay, we got a couple more questions, guys, and then we're gonna have to end this. Uh, we said, uh, Andrew says, bless you, Matt. We have another one. Uh, <laughs> we have Ter Terrence3027 on Instagram. Matt, what is your favorite jerkbait rod? Uh, Dobbin 705 CB Fury. It's a hundred and twenty dollar rod. Uh, and if you use if you use Matt's link, he also gets some money off that. So make sure you uh, use his special QR code. Um, oh Ray Dalton, which glide is he talking about? The one sixty eight something? Oh. Yeah. River to Sea S Waiver one sixty eight. They have them on Tackle Warehouse. All I mean, they it's all over the place. Uh, they're not, they're not hard to find. They're pretty cheap. Um, you can grab a couple of them. Light trout works really good. I would recommend getting like a light trout color and then get um, one, uh, hit one color that's like clear and it's got like kind of a silver blue back to it and it's got a bunch of sparkles in it. That works really well. Colors and tie it on your heavy crankbait rod with like 17 pound fluoro or whatever you can co poly and just go start throwing it we got another one here brandon souls we got tom you need to get a john boat i need a john boat i need a kayak and i need a new bass boat oh <laughs> what did matt say <laughs> and a truck <laughs> and a truck yeah. My truck is dying too. Yeah, that is sad. Oh, wow. Uh let's see. Falls on the roof. <laughs> uh Russ is asking about that spinner bait. Was it a three fourth or one ounce? Uh my extra large spinner bait that I was using? Yeah. Uh it's actually one and a half ounces. Good oh. Jesus wept. That's you what can... I'm talking about. I need what is it? Jesus. Jack so... I can't so, so, um, again, like you can do this to any spinner bait. I mean, I, I used to take like one ounce spinner baits and just change the willow blade on them, but I did like this megalo. Um, it's a jackal megalo spinner bait. They're, they're kind of hard to find. You have to get them from Japan. I don't think they're any sold in the U S but there's some websites. If anybody's interested, I mean, I can probably find you them on, I, cause I did find some on, um, some websites, but yeah, I've got a few J sites from back when i used to try to source tiny clashes before you could get them they missed a insanely good marketing opportunity by not calling that megalodon i don't i don't know why <laughs> it's like I, you know, yeah i think it's yeah. mega low mega low spinnerbait not megalodon but i keep calling it megalodon <laughs> yeah I, I know right it makes sense uh okay two more questions guys and then we're gonna we're gonna we're going to dial this back here. I know you guys could probably keep me here all night, but these poor gentlemen have like jobs and families. Um, I can talk when, about fishing all night. I, I we, really ain't got, could. we ain't got kids. None of us are married. We'll take hey, you yeah, there you us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> going to be doing yeah. after. So 
I mean, as long well, as you want to go. Well, Phil, if you want, maybe hit me up and we could probably, uh, we'll go out on Friday. Uh, and then we got Hunter. looks like he's having a great time in the back of the queue. We will bring on Hunter in a minute. Anyway, uh, when tossing Toss around a glove. What? Uh, I was just reading the comment. Oh, sorry. When tossing around a glide, what type of areas do you throw it? Not specific areas, but what type of areas? Everywhere. Yeah. If you got scope over top laydowns, big giant laydowns is really good. It's probably my favorite. Yeah. That brush piles, uh, flats, bluff walls. I mean, you can really throw it everywhere. It's just, it depends on what type of structure the fish actually want to bite it on. Yeah. Interesting. We have a Patreon supporter that asked a very interesting question. It also depends like what time of year it is, where they're staged at in regards to the spawn. Um, like right now, they're still kind of hanging more towards main lake. At least the bigger fish are. And that'll fluctuate with weather and moon patterns and all that good stuff there you have it uh guys get all your questions in here soon we'll probably be doing another uh, live stream from the water here shortly as long as i can get good cell service we'll definitely be back on the res uh, i don't have family this weekend i have to deal with for easter i don't think but i'll get yelled at probably um i'll, I'll meet you guys out there on friday i'll see you out there slide fish slide fish over top submerged grass if you get the chance that's really fun what I see tight lines. Okay. And then we got one more question here. here. Let me, how do I add my, all right, add this back to the stage. Uh, Patreon supporter wants to know uh, specifically, this is a weedless bull shad. If you've ever seen this bait before, how would you fish it? Uh, That thing just came out. I've never thrown one. Grass. I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> Grass. Yeah. Bed. Yeah, rip yeah. that thing through. It's funny because actually, I, that's I've never seen that either, and I, I'm actually now interested in that because one of my favorite baits is those mini, the mini bull shad and bull gills, which is right here. The is like the mini bull gill, bull gills. So I think they've now come out with looks like the soft version oh, of this bull shad. Which I, that's interesting. All right, we're gonna give. I, like I apologize, it. but we're gonna give this guy a little bit of love. He is homeless and he really needs attention. All right, Hunter, you're on right now. You got 30 seconds. Hey, everyone. Just wanted to say hello. <laughs> wanted to jump on here. Um, follow HPS Fishing on Instagram and YouTube. And, yeah, hope everyone has a great night. Let's live stream the concert. <laughs> I'm at a Zach Bryan concert right now. <laughs> hope everyone's uh doing good. Hunter, Hunter, people want to know um, how many videos you're going to upload per year. Per year, we're looking at three, three videos. <laughs> year, four. Um, looking to top last year of one. That is disturbing. But yeah, three, three videos this year is the goal. Uh, we'll see if we surpass that. Means thirty-three, and we'll see if is we go below that. that. Time will tell. Oh man. Oh, that was haunting. All right. Well, thank, thank you, Hunter. That was fun. Love you, boys. Later. <laughs> ah. that's funny that was horrible that was <laughs> terrifying as hell. Oh, uh I, I i would be remiss uh in our closing thoughts what did you guys think of the classic mega bass vision uh, one plus one for the win again <laughs> have you ever thought about throwing jerk baits that are not mega bass nope I said nope <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I got a bunch. Of, I got a bunch of different jerk baits. There's a time and a place for each one, but they just is bite it, that mega bass. <laughs> but then again, is it self fulfilling prophecy of like you just fish it, therefore they will bite it? I mean, I think a lucky craft or anything that you put in front of the right fish, they'll bite it. But I just, yeah, I love how deep I can get the mega bass quickly, and oh, they. Uh. I just, they bite. I, all I can say is they bite it. That's it. It's, I've caught so many fish where they just have it completely gone down in their throat and there was zero hesitation. It's like a rapple of jerk bait or other jerk baits. Like they might follow it all the way to the boat, but I mean, 
and it's still a lower percentage of fish, but with that mega bass, I mean, you get it in front of them and it usually doesn't take long. How do you deal with them choking the bait down so far and not having to have a bunch of dead fish in your live well? Have you gotten Mountain, that down? Mountain Dew. <laughs> I've heard of that. You laugh. So I'm not joking, man. <laughs> yeah, I've heard of that. Time where we were catching them so good on eight inch mag draft and it was automatic. They were getting a hook in the gill because it's just the hooks on the bottom. And it was a problem because you can't weigh in dead fish on Fountainhead, which is an awesome rule, in my opinion. But um, in a situation like that, what, like you need something to clot the blood. And if you, as soon as you catch them, if you pop a bottle of Mountain Dew open and you pour it down their throat, like a good amount, it will clot it and they live every hmm. time. Yeah. Mountain Dew, yeah, catch them. I mean, I'm not sure about like uh, the G juice or anything, but I know catch and release will do it too. So, I mean, but Mountain, Mountain Dew has been the best thing for us. I'm not sure if like any kind of carbonated drink would, would do the same thing, but. So wouldn't Budweiser work then too? Cause it's carbonated. Leader, Cause my luck, I'll totally forget what the Mountain Dew was in the boat for and I'll drink it all before. <laughs> <laughs> And the hot. Have you guys, <laughs> have you guys uh, tried the new Berkeley Credge jerk bait? I've been loving that on the on the live scope. You know I what I'm talking no, about? Uh, the reverse spy bait. That one. It's it's the reverse spy bait. It's like yep. the uh, yeah reverse yeah, jerk bait, whatever. And the bill goes up, so when you jerk it, it goes up, but it also flutters and sinks down away from you. So every time you have it in front of the fish, you can kind of just like jerk it up. And then you'll see it on live scope, just like flutter right back down in front of the fish. I've it caught is, a couple on. I've caught a couple on it so far. I've, I've been having a lot of fun with it. Um, I think it's the first jerk, sinking jerk bait that they've come out with. It's a very unique design, and it's very niche. Um, I think it's an interesting thing right now like with it. all of the baits that are coming out, where you're getting very specific to forward facing sonar techniques with you know the different minnows. Now they're making rods that are forward facing sonar specific. You're making the baits it. What's funny when we look back in the history, how we're going to this is a thing now, but then also like stupid little like L, like hooks and weights for that, like both are what's in play right now. It's kind of fascinating. Yeah. Um, we have a fun question. Uh, I'm not against live scope, but um, the Im imagine five years or less from now, live scope sunglasses, hands free, impossible, clear scope for species of fish and weight of fish when they start to cut back rule i live scope's not going anywhere like, no but to, to to his point it's like when is the when is the line drawn and i get right. it i mean you can do whatever the hell you want i do not care if you want to put live scope on a pair of glasses i'm all for it i'm i'm totally against having any more than one transducer on your boat but it, it, like it's you can do whatever the hell you want, but it is, that will be insane. Like if, if it gets to a point where you can specifically tell, I mean, I can tell you right now the difference between a striper and a large mouth for the most part, if it's a big, if it's a big striper, obviously, cause you can see the size, but if it gets to that point where it's so specific as to like, it shines a different color on a different fish or something like that, which I could totally see happening. Like I'm good. No, thanks. Happen. The technology is already there. Marine biologists already have yep. technology yeah. that. I'm, yeah, I don't scope. think they're they're not giving us what they have. They're just gonna just like everything else, like laptops, phones. They're just give you a little bit at a time. I mean, I'm sure they got the technology to it tells you the species of fish and much clearer images and everything. They're just it's all it's all for money. They're just gonna fade fade it all right? in through time and through time. So and yeah, live scope is yeah. definitely not going anywhere. Cool. You, either get on the game or, or don't. So it's definitely not going They're anywhere. Just out right now, how to make that technology into a more affordable platform. That's a play fast boats. That's probably, I would almost be willing to bet money that that's what's going on right now at Garmin and Lawrence and Hummingbird. Yeah. I had a, uh, I had an engineer on last year, um, and he talked about this, that the issue is power. We are getting to the point where we're hitting the, we're hitting the absolute cap of how much power we have on a boat. Cause if you guys remember in the chat, 
when having four batteries in the boat was amazing. And now we're looking at six, seven, eight, like you could get more powerful units, but it's going to suck up way more juice. And I think that's going to be the real inhibitor when it comes to technological advancements is you're going to need more juice in your boat to power it. When it comes from the rules to limit it, it I, I kind of agree with McCluskey. I think you should just say like, okay, if you're in a professional organization, two graphs total, one at the council, one up front, four graphs, like that's what you need to limit more so than anything else. Cause then that would limit the transducers too in well, my brain. Yeah, I guess limiting graphs would go into limiting transducers, but I just like you just one transducer because I don't care how many graphs you got on your boat. Side scan, mapping, and 2D is only going to get you so far. Like mm -hmm. these guys and what people who are efficient with live scope do, they're seeing a single fish. Like you can only look at one screen at once at one time, you know, like it's, it's just, I don't know, but the, yeah, the, the, the screens thing, Brian Schmidt's boat, I assume most people saw the Chris Zaldane video where he went through everybody's boat and showed their setups and asked them how much they think it costs. He has four 12 inch screens at the dash. That is a safety hazard. <laughs> it, it totally is. Oh man. That like they really showed it in the video. They were measuring how the height. We talked about this in the last Monday night, night live with the BFO guys, but like they're they're measuring the height of the graphs to make sure people can see over them. Like, get out of here! Like, it's getting it's getting out of control, in my opinion. It's getting I've, cartoonish. Yeah, yeah. I, I, it's also a fun parody world we live in, where these pros are running. A thousand graphs, a hundred fifty thousand dollar boat. Icon, aka IKEA, came out with a hundred fifty thousand dollar boat, and then they're complaining that the money's drying up in the industry. And it's like, is the money drying up, or are you guys just spending it all? <laughs> like it, it's yeah. pricing it, out. Which that's why so many people are pissed off. Which I get about that. Like I don't think it was live scope that was pricing you out. I think it was the boats. I think it was all the additional costs. I think it was everything else piling yeah. on top of the fish these tournament that's price and everything i think it was live scope it was like you know what about 360 what about power poles what about what about you know it, entry fees yeah. all this extra stuff rising boat prices that's following the truck industry where they're like oh everybody buys off credit we can just keep pricing them higher and higher each year and they're still gonna buy them because they're buying them on credit so yeah. I don't know. It's what I, if I was in charge of bass, what I would do, I would go back to the old, I'm almost positive this would work. You get a fleet of boats for each angler. Each one's rigged out the same. You get a live scope up front. You get two units in the back. Get your side scan, you know, and bass can sign big deals with these companies for the boat for the units all that and well, definitely even the playing field yep yeah angler gets to bring his tack and they go to surprise lakes everybody's gonna want to watch that everybody's gonna love it bass will be able to do it way better than mlf tried to i was gonna say like, didn't your dad come up with this idea already yeah boy <laughs> like it's that is like i think that's what we need right now to bring everything back together to where everybody's semi-content i think that's what needs to happen brian green unfortunately man. it's not unfortunately it's not though so yeah that's the shitty part you know that's just a uh, flex yeah. tried it uh yep 100 percent uh andy i'm fixing to change my live scope to an ice shuttle so i can go from boat to my kayak to my brother's 9.9 .9. oh flw yeah oh yeah flw had it but then like the bassmaster classic used to be that way too where everyone was basically running them the identical boats as well uh let's see where was the last comment i just lost that i keep saying one more uh it's a matter of time until someone cheats using everyone's gonna cheat for god's sakes people were shoving weights down a fish's throat like everyone cheats it's all gonna happen just it's human nature baby i don't think eating at the top oh but... yeah oh yeah yeah i think jacob wheeler and dc are cheating 
but is it cheating well, or bending okay. the rules? They're yeah. they're they're living in the gray area. Yeah, yeah. like like taking steroids. I mean, uh, I mean, I truly think I truly think that they're better than everybody with forward facing sonar. I mean, that's why Jacob Wheeler is so dominant. I mean, they're better at shaking a minnow than everybody else. It's just what it was at the beginning of the season. I think that they're better at shaking a minnow, but also Jacob Wheeler is an apprentice to Scott Martin, whose father was, uh, Roland Martin was big about getting information and having a house full of people that know what you're doing. So Scott did the same thing. And Jacob Wheeler does the exact same thing. He's just, he's mirroring it. I mean. Yeah, but there's also a difference in the finishes. If you look at Jacob Wheeler's last four years and Scott Martin's last four years, if Scott's rooming with the best, then uh, why is why hasn't he won <laughs> five BPT events? Because there's something, I don't know if it was the last live or whatever, where it's like you hit a certain age and you just suck in fishing. I don't know who said that on this show or somewhere said that. Phil, was that you? I definitely could have said it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was somewhere, and guys, just let me know in the comment section when this gets re-uploaded, that it was like when you hit a certain age, like your performance really does drop until you hit Rick Clun age, and then it bounces back. Um, but but it's something Rick interesting here with that. Rick what? Clun will die if he retired. He has to do this to stay alive at this point. <laughs> he actually talked about that on... Um mercer podcast he was like yeah i don't believe in retirement he's like that's when people die and i agree with that 100 percent. i've seen it a million times in the blue collar field like guys literally get out of the trades and they die like a year later because hmm. they're not doing anything that's so their body just starts shutting down we got Shane. I just pissed off a whole age demographic. What age do you start sucking at fishing? I just want to be prepared. So the statistical thing here is they they put all these. I think Jay Kumar did it. Bass Blaster. Go check that out. Where it's like when a, when hit, fishermen hit a certain age, you can start seeing their their finishes really deteriorate. And you saw this with Kevin Van Dam when he really he was just dominating, and then he hit a rut, and then it took him a long time to kind of bounce back. My hypothesis is this. It's not necessarily the age correlation that you get, you're too old to do it. I think you get so set in your ways in your, I don't know, let's say 30s and 40s as a professional angler that's been doing it for 20 years, that it's harder for you to adapt to new trends and things. I think that's actually what it is. It just correlates with the age part of it. Yeah. Let's see. Mm, yep. Yeah. And then we got Paris. Yeah, I, oh. I hear, I hear some, some guys at the bow ramp. I mean, they're, they're kind of in the older years, and they're like, "Man, I can't keep up with these younger guys in these live scopes." So, I mean, they're they're oh, ass hunter. Ass hunter still getting it. Yeah, um, yeah, he I is. Was, um, yeah, he there was is. a meeting. Wasn't there a meeting at the first Fountainhead tournament about banning live scope? There was going to be a vote. I heard there was going to be a vote, but they never ended up having it. I don't know. Maybe yeah. Matt Matt knows more. Ace no, and- I, I I didn't hear anything about it. I w- I'm down for a vote though. Juan, was, Juan like, was telling me, Juan was asking me after the first tournament, he's like, hey, they didn't have a vote on the live scope. I said, I said, no, I didn't even hear about anything yeah. about that. So I mean, I've never had anybody, Mikey or anybody like seriously correlated with the club. I think there should be a vote. There, there should be a, a vote on the um the six fish thing. There should be a vote on that. I don't know if I agree. I don't think the yeah, majority really that, favors it. But. Well, Good thing this isn't about money. We're just about we just want to go there and have a good time. So yeah, exactly. It used to be about money when they were pulling thirty boats. Well, why not raise the entry fees a little bit just to help have better payback? Just because it's not about the money. I mean, as much as it would be nice to, I mean, if you win, you're still going to get four to six hundred bucks each, which is which is nice for a John boat tournament. But it's just. I drive I, the last two weekend. The last two weekends, I've driven back from Roanoke, which is three and a half hours to my house to fish these tournaments. And even if I did win, gas money and all that travel shit, it wouldn't cover it. Like we just fish these for fun. Like, yeah, I hear I hear what you're saying. We need to raise the entry fees to really help pay for McCluskey's mortgage. So if no, you guys find dude. it in your hearts, <laughs> I mean, I'm basically fishing for fun too because I know I'm handing my money away to McCluskey or Strykel or Alderman <laughs> at this point. But yeah, it's, it it really is for fun. I I yeah. enjoy it just as much as any others. So 
anybody can win on any given day. Like I just, True. It, there's yeah. right now the lake is fishing so good and there's so many five to six pounders biting as, like I said earlier, if you get that one key bite and you figure out what the deal is, you can go from zero pounds to 30 pounds in an hour. So it's, yeah. it's I mean, anybody's ball game. I'm, yeah. And that's another reason I'm trying to compete with you guys is to, cause I know that that can happen. It's, I know that I that's can. A good mind, do it that's a good mindset you know. to have because yeah. a lot of people have come into the club and they get intimidated when they see twenty-five to thirty pounds. If you even want to sniff a check, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm good on that," but yeah, no, it makes me want to do it even more. It makes me even want to right. want it more. That's right. Will and this is the last question. I promise everyone in the chat, and then we'll actually be be finished here. Um, will there ever be a a forty-pound bag? You think? Yes. Broken. It's yep. gonna happen on on the res, yes. <laughs> For oh, six might not be in a... They need like two. They need like a what? Two eight pounders and yeah, two I don't eight know, pounders. That can even happen. Any We're everything doing... else needs to be over six and a half pounds, and you need two eight yeah. pounders. It's just absolutely ridiculous. But it swims in the lake, so that's so stupid, guys. God, it's so stupid. Um, I'm I mean, looking... it could happen. Oh, go for it, Phil. No, I was just saying it, it could happen this spring, like, with the, like, I've never seen anything like what we've seen the past two weeks in a Virginia body of water. It's stupid. It's the best lake in Virginia, or like one of them. Uh, if it's if it's not the best, it's got to be top five, right? I mean, I know everyone's probably got a sneaky lake, but I just meant in general, without naming names, it's top five, right? You think? Yep. That's oh yeah. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, I'm gonna I want to make sure. I want to make sure we get everyone to bed. Um, I really, really appreciate everyone coming on last minute like this. It's absolutely awesome. Uh, Ricky Falk, Sandy River is a good one. I'm going to be doing a Hidden Gems there as well. That's a really a banger. Uh, hunting Run, I saw Hunting Run, yeah. There was, a, I think somebody just caught a 12-pounder out of there this past week. Yep. Someone just sent it to me. Yeah, so it's, wow. it's yeah. there's so many lakes like that that are hunting awesome. That whole, that whole area around Sandy River and Briary's got them. Yeah, yeah. Mechanicsville, Farmville, all the lakes in that area, those are like my favorite, like r reservoir aside, really. I mean, but you're talking about bass that are also, they're, they're like hybrid strain. They're, you have Florida strain and Florida genetics in those lakes as well. So you got hybrid, you got Florida bass, and you got northern strain all mixed together. So, but the fishing is just phenomenal. Matt is completely right. Guys, again, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, I mean, it's last thing, we'll go around. Um, yeah, I mean, S Stephen, you first. Anyone you want to promote or anything like that you got coming up? You know, not really. I mean, just shout out to all my good friends. You know who you are. Um, you've been there for me throughout the years. Um, yeah, I mean, not not really. I just, I don't want to pick and choose anybody over the other, but you know who you are, guys. So I appreciate you there for being there for me. Phil? Uh, shout out to Minn Kota, Four Tracks specifically, Coors, Gambler Coors Bass, Light, Coors Light, Coors, uh, Coors Light, Zen, um, Apple AirPods, uh, <laughs> and, and shout out to um, you, Thomas, for having us on here, though, for real. Nah, dude, I just I, I'm blessed to be near you. Yeah, I couldn't, have, uh, couldn't do it without any of those fantastic entities. Uh, Matt Allen. Oh, who me? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us on. I'm glad we could do this. It sucked. It was a week late compared to yeah. it being fresh. We we wanted to do it, but yeah. also, you, guys, you know, you last guys week. will be there. You guys will be there in two weeks. Yep, two weeks, baby. Oh, yeah, are you gonna? You we missed you Go yesterday. Ahead. I was going to say, um, also, I meant to say uh, on my YouTube channel, Nisumi Outdoors, I'm going to be posting the weigh-ins of the um, the Fountainhead Bass Club weigh-ins. Because um, nice. so, I have I have both now recorded as well, including that oh, club nice. record being broken. So 
uh Sick. guys if you want to just check out my channel here in the next few days i'm going to post it and so you guys can watch the weigh-ins and i also have footage of of me and my partner catching fish as well so it'll be uh cool so stay tuned that's freaking awesome see some, see some big fish yeah. and then uh matt you also have a youtube channel right did you want to promote that no <laughs> got gills right got gills. yeah my part my partner does the he posts videos and stuff it's got gills but he, he hasn't posted either of the tournaments from this year but the most recent one was the the old club record now from last year who will post more videos this year got gills or hunter got gills <laughs> i think i'll videos than hunter this year <laughs> camera yet uh, got, i also got some amazing fish? um got some amazing drone footage of the, the aquaquan reservoir too on my channel if anybody wants to check out like the bull run area and that whole like upper lake and uh, i think like episode nine or something so my yeah. app true you coming to fish with me this weekend phil what are you trying it sunday yes sir I can't do Sunday, man. That's that's big Aww. family. Oh, I guess it is Easter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, otherwise, I absolutely would be hitting Muma. I love that oh, yes. lake. We're coming for you, Muma. I've never been there, but there's there's tournaments there every Sunday. And oh, there, dude, there's a chance I might come down. Yeah, come fish it. Or just like, um, I don't know if you'd be able to live stream. It's Shit. really tough. It's it's tough. But they're in there, and it's so not like it's probably the prettiest lake in Virginia that you'll fish. Nice. It's forty-five minutes from the Airbnb, so. Oh, sick. Oh yeah. But all right, boys, I'm I'm gonna jet. See you guys. Like and subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. All right. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host Thomas Aaron's and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by